This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, Atom Audio, and Isotope. You're hearing my voice right now on a Jay-Z pop filter and BB-29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100D Mic Pre and Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD. So get ready to rock. I love the way that I feel when I hear a voice intermittently through that effect on a recording. Like Bon Iver's 22 a million, third track is 715 Creeks. And it's just him singing through this like invention that he and his producer Chris Messina made. The whole song is just him, vocals through this vocal processing thing. The alienness of that sound and the, the like beauty of it, it's so cool. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. No matter where you like to rock in the galaxy, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron lets you record with confidence over USB-C with up to more than a gigabyte per second real-world performance. Transfer tracks in seconds and take your sessions with you wherever you go. Built for reliability, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Find the new OWC Envoy Pro Electron and all your storage needs at MaxSales.com slash Rockstars. If you're ready to discover the secrets to making your mixes sound great, no matter what your studio situation, then check out my free mixing course, MixMasterBundle.com, where I show you how to get great sounding mixes in your studio using simple techniques and free plugins. And when you're ready for more advanced studio skills, then check out RecordingStudioRockstars.com slash Academy, where you can learn from Grammy-winning teachers to help you record, edit, mix, and master your best record ever. Use the code Rockstar right now at checkout for 10% off any course for a limited time. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Colin Scharf, a songwriter, producer, filmmaker, author, and English professor living in Mankato, Minnesota. Am I pronouncing that right? Do you guys say it Mankato like that? <laughs> Mankato. Mankato. Yeah. Oh Man-Kato. boy, there I was. I was really trying to sound all like, you know, I don't know, smart. No, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Colin and his wife, Laura, co-front the indie rock band Goodnight Gold Dust, which has released five albums toured the Midwest, shared stages with national and international touring acts, and gained critical acclaim from Minnesota Public Radio's 89.3, The Current, the UK's Clash Magazine, Atwood Magazine, and many others. And I'm actually going to intro this by reading the email that I got from you, Colin, if you don't mind. That's fine, man. That's cool. All right. So, Rockstars, I got this great email in my inbox one day. And it went like this. Hi, Lidge. Greetings and Happy New Year. I'm Colin, a musician recording engineer from Mankato, Minnesota. And I've been meaning to reach out to you all year to let you know how happy I am to have discovered your Recording Studio Rockstars podcast. At the end of 2019, I signed a contract with my local newspaper to produce my first major album, a holiday compilation featuring musicians from my city performing standard and original songs. I had done plenty of recording by that point, enough anyway to feel confident taking on the job, but I knew that if I wanted to make the holiday compilation sound professional, not only would I need to acquire more gear, um, we can talk about that later, (laughs) I'd also need to deepen my knowledge of recording and mixing. So early in 2020, just before the pandemic hit, I typed, quote, recording into the search field of my Apple Podcasts app, and there it was, recording studio rock stars, dun, dun, dun. (laughs) I hit play, and after listening for about 20 minutes, I distinctly recall thinking, I should take notes. Since then, <laughs> good, I'm glad you thought that, because that's, that's what I recommend. Since then, I dove headfirst into the podcast and listened constantly. Recording Studio Rockstars is an invaluable resource, and between listening to the episodes and spending the majority of quarantine recording and mixing, 
I'm amazed at how much I've learned and how much better my mixes sound now than they did a year ago. I'm deeply excited to continue learning and producing more next year. In fact, as I've been typing this note, a friend just reached out and asked if I'd mix his new single. Talk about real-time processing. <laughs> That's great, man. <laughs> Rockstars, in January of 2021, Colin officially opened Gold Mine Studios, so we'll talk about that. Colin is also going to be producing River City Holiday Volume 2, so I guess that's a follow-up to the record, the compilation that you did that we'll be talking about on the show, yeah. and directing a promotional music video for the Mankato chapter of the American Lung Association. It may have taken 20 years of trial and error, but Colin is excited to finally be channeling his energy into doing what he loves the most, helping people make cool music. I like that. I might have to steal that for my podcast intro. Yeah, recording man, can, studio rock stars helping people make cool music. Heck please, yeah. yeah, please welcome Colin Sharp to recording studio rock stars. Colin, are you ready to rock, dude? I was born ready, man. Dude, welcome to the show, man. It's an honor to have you here. And that email really, really made my day. I remember that, um, and it was just such a cool story. I thought, why not invite you onto the show and, and talk about it? I mean, I love sort of hearing, you know, the. Uh, the success story of one of the rock stars. Yeah, I, I like it's all true. <laughs> um, I, I remember I was in the basement folding laundry, and I thought, well, I've got to make this record this year, so I probably should, you know, everything I wrote in the email to you. And uh, yeah, I, it's like the only podcast that I really listen to. Um, That's awesome. You know, Thank you. Yeah, with 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 regularity. Yeah. Well, um, you know, it's a big pleasure listening to your music too. So, good night, good night, Gold Dust is a super cool band. Um, you guys have been making some great music. Um, rock stars, I've included a playlist in the show notes, so click through and you can go listen to the Spotify um, a couple of records there. Just really cool. Um, it sounds great. It's great songwriting. It's like really great treatments. Um, you and your wife Laura both have. Great singing voices, and uh, I, you know, I, I saw the connection there between being an English teacher and great songwriting. I think that's kind of been a, a thing that's gone on, you know, historically. Um, I just feel like you, have, you guys have a good appreciation for music. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, um, we started Gold Dust in 2010, and I mean, you know, 2020 was going to be our like 10 year anniversary. I, I had this whole retrospective kind of thing planned, like. We were going to dive into the back catalog and and play all the old songs and you know all kinds of a big, a big horn section and all kinds of fun stuff and then, you know that kind of got uh, quashed a bit. But um, yeah, I I mean thanks for all those kind words about the group. We've it's just sort of the thing that's I don't know we've just been doing it. <laughs> I guess it's just keep our heads down and keep making cool music and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Already uh, breaking out some good vocab words. Have you used quashed in a song lyric yet? <laughs> I don't think so. Has anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I hesitated to use that word, frankly. That was <laughs> a good one. Now. Thanks. <laughs> I wonder if anybody's yeah. used quashed. That's quashed about, and maybe squashed like, both in the same song. Yeah. Maybe like Elvis Costello. I can see him maybe, throwing yeah. that out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, watching the detectives quash the, uh, yeah. I don't know, something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, let's see. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, who you are getting into music. Uh, I think it was evident to me that, you know, as you said, you've been doing this for a minute, but it is fun. And, and I feel the same way hosting this podcast. I've learned a ton from all the guests and just really bringing a network of, of musicians and producers and engineers together to just kind of share all this information, but you tell us about some of your background in recording and, and making music. Yeah. So, um, I, I kind of like to start at the, at the very top, I guess. Uh, so my grandmother, my, my father's mother was, was a musician. She was a music teacher, a piano player. She played violin. Um, and you know, I, whenever I meet a musician, I'm, I'm always like, where did you get, you know, your music from? And cause I just think it's so interesting to, to see like how it's passed down sort of through the blood, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, it's always sort of striking to me to meet somebody who doesn't have any music in their family. Like my, my drummer, uh, Michelle, she's like, my family, there's no music in our family, but she's a, a great pianist, a great songwriter, a great percussionist. Yeah. Um, so she's kind of one of those like outliers. But yeah, so I remember like when I was a kid, I had a little, um, oh yeah, that's right. I, I had the uh, 
talk boy from Home Alone 2, the thing that um, Macaulay Culkin had in that movie. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, right. And I would just like sing into it and sort of like, you know, try to write little songs. And then... Did it have like cassette on it or something like it that? It did, yeah, man. It was like, you know, just a one track recorder, I guess. Um, and then, I mean, this is sort of a dorky story, but the, the Ninja Turtles had a band around 1990, maybe 91. And I was like five or six and the turtles, you know, they had their guitars and all this <laughs> stuff. And I was like, oh my God, I need to play guitar, mom. And I remember begging her, like, can I please play guitar? I'm five years old, you know? That's awesome. I love that yeah, the, the yeah. Ninja Turtles, Mutant Ninja Turtles are the Dude, influence to start yeah. music and bands. Yeah. I mean, I was taking karate already and then I'm trying to, <laughs> and then I, I ended up with this like, I would love to see the guitar that that came from the JCPenney catalog. It was like, I think it had nylon strings. It was like an electric, you know, plastic thing with a crappy little amp. And all I did was just like strum it through the amp and it made horrible sounds. But, um, you know, music was always sort of in in me. And then by the time I was like 13, I was begging, begging, begging my mom, like, please, please, can I play guitar? And then the month before my 14th birthday, I got an acoustic guitar from my aunt, took lessons on that for a month. And then uh, for my, I think it was like September of that year, about a month after my birthday, I got my first Fender Stratocaster. Wow. So, and then yeah. what about the influence of the music that you wanted to play? I mean, were you just basically trying to learn Mutant Ninja Turtle songs <laughs> the whole time? No. Um, you know, I, I grew up in, in the hills of Western New York, about an hour south of Buffalo. Uh, so really kind of rural, sort of like, like, you know, equal parts Appalachia and sort of, I, I don't know, it was just sort of a, an odd little So you're playing area. old time music. <laughs> well, I definitely grew up like listening to like Garth Brooks and that 90s country stuff. Um, so, you know, for a long time, I was like, man, the country music's the, the way to be. But then I turned like 12, 13, and I was like, oh, country music is the worst. I want to listen to rock and roll. And somehow eventually found my way into punk rock. And I, I remember like, um, listening to Rancid's Out Come the Wolves for the first time. And, you know, people talk about listening to those records, like whatever record it was for you, I felt like I was doing something like dangerous, uh, but also it felt so good <laughs> to like yeah. finally find the music that was like, that my like soul was after. And then from there, yeah, I I, I just dove like sort of headfirst into, I, I was buying like, punk rama compilations and all those horrible sort of like big oh, mixes so from like the local <laughs> CD store and stuff. And um, was lucky enough to like get in with some guys who were a bit older than me and they were playing in a band. Uh, and the, the, the front man of that group, this guy named Alex, like sort of took me under his wing, introduced me to like all kinds of cool UK punk from the seventies, um, mainly yeah. the clash. And, you know, kind of from there, um, it was a lot of punk rock, a lot of, you know, British and New York city punk. And then I kind of got into more like indie rock as I got into college. Yeah. So interesting. Um, you know, you're talking about the end of the 90s too, right? It's kind of yeah. this, this time yep. frame for you or mid, mid 90s to the end of the 90s. Yeah. So so Nirvana had already kind of broken the world wide open and grunge was on its way out already or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I've been kind of fascinated with that era. Um, I I do a lot of, you know, I, you know, as, as mentioned, I'm also an English teacher. I have a master's in creative writing. So um, one of my big projects that I've always kind of working on is this novel about these musicians who are trying to go on tour and their lead singer dies. And um, mm -hmm. I'm always, I'm always just so fascinated, especially by Nirvana and by that whole grunge thing, because it, I, I just missed it. You know, I was just young enough that it just totally went over my head. Um, and I've listened to like podcasts and read articles and done all kinds of, you know, research into that era of like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, all those groups. Um, because I they just they just had really no bearing on my life except for the music that they sort of influenced, which was that like later '90s like sort of like heavy rock into like like new metal kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just remember like being you know twelve, thirteen, fourteen. And all my friends were listening to like Kid Rock and Limp Biscuit, and I was yeah. like, God, I'm sorry, I just I couldn't stand it. You know, it was <laughs> like this is this sucks. <laughs> uh, and so it was like such a breath of fresh air to kind of find like that that punk rock stuff which was at least felt a little more positive than sort of like break stuff by limp biscuit you know what about the the meat puppets were they on your uh, radar at all they weren't you know there's so many eras and so many like 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 groups and little subgroups of, of of punk especially that i just sort of like like missed uh incidentally though the meat puppets have 
in the past played Mankato. I think they played here like five years ago. There's this like like uh, rock club called the What's Up Lounge here in town that like tons and tons and tons of bands played um, from the early 90s. Like Green Days played Mankato a ton of times. Well, they played Mankato a ton of times, you know, in the early 90s. I think Billy Joe Armstrong, according to legend, uh, actually met his now wife in Mankato. Um, so there's a really, really good like, like uh, punk scene history in, in this town. Um, and again, it was all that early 90s era stuff. So I wasn't here <laughs> and I missed all of that. But um, What's when Mankato I was, like? I mean, you know, we're talking Minnesota. So you guys yeah. get about one month of summer. <laughs> yep. Yep. I mean, it's Something well, like yeah. that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a wild town. Um, uh, let's see. So it's a river city. Um, so we kind of have that sort of like energy of a river city uh, as opposed to like most of Minnesota. Minnesota is sort of known for its lakes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But we huh? have we have uh, the we, we have a river, you know, flowing through here. Um, and so it sort of has this sort of like rough kind of industrial sort of sort of vibe. Actually, my my studio where I'm sitting right now um, is in an, a warehouse in the basin of, of a warehouse sort of on the other side of the river. Um, but yeah, like Mankato is a, you know, there's a four year college, a four year state university here. There, There's a, a private Lutheran university here. It's a town of about 50,000, you know, give or take. Um and I moved here in 2007 for grad school, uh, you know, with fully intending on moving back to New York, you know, and maybe moving to New York City or doing something like that. But, um, you know, I moved to Mankato, went to grad school, met Laura, who, you know, then became my, you know, we got married in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, Did but you start the band first or get married first? We started the band first. Yeah, we we sort of, that's a, that's a totally long, different story, <laughs> which I'm happy to tell, but I think it would sort of divert the, nice. the show here. Um, but yeah, as far as Mankato goes, just to kind of wrap it up, um, it's, it's a city that's full of really, really great energy. Uh, and you know, it's, it's grown so much over the past 10 years that I've been here. And I just feel really, it, it feels kind of like the city where if you want to do something, there's enough people around with, with enough energy, uh, to like do it, you know? So with the Christmas record that we, that I recorded, um, it was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, there was no, there was no precedent for it. There was nothing to like live up to or, or to sort of like talk yourself out of doing it because somebody else is doing it better. Right. It's, it's the kind of town where if you have an idea, you can really, really bring it, bring it to fruition. That's cool. Yeah. So looking on the map, you guys are just sort of a little South and a little West of Minneapolis too, which is yeah, a yep. major music hub as well. Totally. It's huge. Yeah. And, you know, as soon as Gold Dust got going, uh, and, and about 2015 is when we went to the studio to do our first studio record. Prior to that, I, I had recorded everything. And in 2015, we did our first studio album. Um, and we just started throwing darts, you know, at, at the Twin Cities and throwing out lines. and Throwing darts um, at the Twin Yeah, Cities. just like, please, it. please, like, can we play up there? And, and eventually, you know, like, started doing really well for ourselves. But... Well, describe, um, you know, um, sure. pandemics aside, describe um, what it's like to be a band wanting to tour and sort of do your thing in the Midwest like that. Well, I mean, you guys are the Midwest, right? Yeah, 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 uh, okay. yeah, yep. Sort Midwest. of the heart of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like you got Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Chicago's not too far away, Iowa. Um, do you guys feel like you're well positioned for being a band that wants to tour a little bit or do you feel like you're sort of far from things and it's a long haul to get there uh i mean i i grew up touring so like just to kind of get back to that high school punk rock story like when i was um 15 that guy that i'd mentioned his name was alex he his his bandmates graduated high school they were going to college and alex was like well i want to keep my band going colin can you play bass in my band and i was like well I'm a guitar player, but like, okay. So just so fear joined, of strings, right? Yeah, just a couple of fear of strings. But it was it was sort of this like I, I was like a lead bassist because it was a three piece, right? Alex played guitar, yeah. drummer. And we so, all know what happens when guitar players play bass the first yeah, time. Yeah, and it was it was cool. <laughs> I would love to go back in time and like see some some VHS footage, you know, of us of us playing. Um so anyway, I I grew up, you know, touring. I, I grew up like just hit the road. We would we, cut. Uh, I was 15 and Alex was like, all right, man, we have a summer tour booked. This is like the summer of At 01. 15, you hit the road. Yeah, dude. Yeah, wow. it was nuts. I, I said to my mom, like, you know, we had already been touring. Like, and this is out weekend. of New York, right? Because yep, you're a yep, yep. long time before you're in right, Minnesota. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, you know, the story for me, like living out here, like there's a lot of distance between, you know, the cities and things like that out here. But like I had grown up touring, like I remember driving seven hours to 
play a show in Virginia with a floor tom on my lap because we were in a little Jeep. So, you know, like sleeping on sidewalks and stuff like that. Um, touring was, was, was just ingrained in me. So when I got out here and Laura and I got the group going, um, you know, like she was from, she's from Wisconsin. So she was driving five hours to see her friends and her family. So yeah, like we just, it just became par for the course and we never really thought twice about it. Let me, let me Um, clarify that for a second. So that kind of touring you're talking about, that's the period of touring and being an abandoned in your life when the pillow that lives in the kick drum is also actually the pillow that you sleep with on the road. <laughs> yeah, right? man. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like curling up in the kick drum at, at somebody's in somebody's basement to exactly. like get a get a couple hours of sleep. Yeah. Uh yeah, man. I mean, that was a lifetime ago. But yeah, so you know, when when Gold Dust got going, um, Laura went to school in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which is about five hours away, just north of Milwaukee. Great so overalls, would, great overalls. Man. Totally, man. I, I remember growing up wearing Oshkosh overalls and being like, what is Oshkosh? And then <laughs> I marry a girl from there. By gosh. So there you go. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we would go to Oshkosh. We'd play shows out there. Laura's had family in Milwaukee. We'd play there. Um, and yeah, we just, I just, I remember... As soon as we put out the studio record in 2015, all I did every morning was like send emails to blogs for reviews and to bands in like surrounding cities and states for shows. Um, and that was about five, that was I mean honestly until like the end of 2019 that was what I was doing <laughs> pretty regularly. Right, that's such a key part of the the DIY punk ethic or ethos, right? Is that yeah learning how to hustle to make things happen. And I mean in all Transparency. I, I recognize that the reason we're here talking right now is because the, you know that's ingrained in you. <laughs> to just send an email about the podcast. Next thing you know, we're on the show together. Um, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. sorry, rock stars. It doesn't mean I can do that with everybody, or else I, I'd <laughs> probably get a lot of emails. But um, I do really enjoy doing this. With so many game-changing Isotope plugins to choose from, deciding which one to buy next could be a bit of a challenge. But did you know that now you can have all their plugins through Isotope's new affordable subscription bundle, Music Production Suite Pro, for only $19.99 per month? Get your Rockstar extended 30-day free trial subscription now at isotope.com rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. Do you need to record direct stereo keyboards? Spectra 1964 now offers the Stereo BBDI 2 with custom wound Hi-Z transformers for big headroom, virtually flat response, and a 15 dB input pad. The Spectra 1964 BBDI passive direct box is also perfect for recording deep bass that will make your mixes sound huge. Plug that into a C610 comp limiter, and as founder Bill Cheney points out, it'll move your pant leg. Get your sound moving at spectra1964.com. You know, I had a question that came in. Um, I thought I'd ask a couple from the rock stars. This one was anonymous. It wasn't signed. So let us know later if it was you. But um, the question was, how do you shop a record once it's done? Do artists still do that? And what other avenues of income are there for finished records? I don't know if you want to spin that into this idea of kind of marketing your own stuff in a punk band. Now here you are. And, you know, maybe you can segue to the um, holiday record you're doing now. But just what are some of your thoughts about that in general? Yeah, that's that's a good question. And it's actually one that a friend sent me last night as well. He he's he was bugging me about um not bugging me. He he had reached out and said, Hey, I, I have an album. Um I'm I'm excited to release it, you know, kind of blah, blah, blah. Uh and I just sort of threw out like, hey man, I've spent the past, you know, X amount of years like hustling and getting promo and et, et cetera for records. And I mean, there's no I, I all I can say is maybe something to the effect of like if you want to get press for it, um, you know, like look up blogs. Um, there's all sorts mm-hmm. of little like aggregates, aggregators or whatever for for um, in, for music blogs and find the blogs, listen to the blogs, um, read the reviews. And, you know, what I was doing for a long time was like reaching out directly to the writers, you know, at the blogs and saying, hey, I read your piece on such and such a group. Uh, it's really great. I'm glad I discovered them. Um you know, and like, here's my music. I'd love it if you if you had a moment. You know, like, be very kind. <laughs> you know, be be yeah. uh, be like grateful and gracious with your with your time and with the person's time. But I mean, man, I don't know. I I feel like we. I feel like Gold Dust lucked out because we worked with a producer in Minneapolis who had a name, 
you know, like he, he had done a lot of work for groups that were already doing really well in the Twin Cities. And so that was sort of like a, a foot in the door, especially with the radio station in Minneapolis, uh, 89.3 The Current. Um, you know, I, I, I emailed one of the DJs there. I said, hey, Andrea, like my name's Colin. I'm in this group, blah, blah, blah. We worked with Brett Boolean. Uh, I want to share our record with you. And she wrote back maybe right away and was like, oh, my God, I love Brett Boolean's work. I'll totally check this out. And the next thing you know, she's playing us on her show. You know, and um, we're we're getting more shows and things like that. So, you know, the, the more I talk, the, the more I I realize that there isn't an answer. <laughs> that yeah, I can just, give it's you connecting the dots, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's really about just like keep your head down and keep moving, um, and and try to make those connections to the people in your in your area and in your scene. I guess it helps if you love what you're doing. That's the other thing too. And, and I mean, like we, we did that record, we spent a ton of money on the record and, you know, we were all just jumping out of our skin with excitement for it, wanting people to, as many people as possible to hear it. And that was a huge motivator as well. You know, so like stay excited about your work and, and don't, you know, let, don't let anything like, like get in the way of, of you, you know, like not trying to push it out as, as much as you can. Yeah. Well, one thing is if you're going to be a guest on a podcast, show up with a good sounding mic and your sounds great. What are you using <laughs> to join us on the show here? I mean, it's the beauty of recording Studio Rocks is we can ask a dumb question like that and it counts. Dude, I love, you know, that's what I love about this podcast is like when I listen to it and, and the guests are like, oh, I'm, I'm running this, I have this, and I'm just like jotting it down in my head. Yeah. Uh, I'm coming to you today with through a uh, Shure SM7B uh, plugged into my Apollo X8 uh, nice. Thunderbolt interface. Yeah, so she's... If it sounds good, that's good, man. Good I like the way you said it. It looks like the Apollo X8 has an extra T <laughs> on the end, too. Yeah, it does. <laughs> that's, yeah. <laughs> um, now, tell us a little bit about your studio that you're in now. Uh, good, um, oh, shoot. I, I thought I had it right in front of me. What do you guys call it? Uh, Goldmine Studios. Yeah, yeah. Goldmine Studios. So um, a few years ago... So I, all of my stories are, are like, all of my answers are going to have stories. Uh, so um, a few years ago, a friend of mine that I went to undergrad with, um, he runs a uh, PR company in, out of Brooklyn. Uh, and he reached out and said, Hey, Colin, um, one of my artists is touring uh, the Midwest and I need a tour manager to take him you know, to Minneapolis and Chicago. Do you know anybody? And I was like, no. And so he's like, well, mm -hmm. do you want to do it? And I said, sure, sounds fun. So I ended up being a tour manager uh, for a, uh, what's the, geez, Minneapolis date. Yeah. And uh, translation, Chicago. you drive the van. I drive the van. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so the artist was this cat named uh, Angelo De Augustine. And he had sort of, so he's really, really beautiful musician, um, solo guitar player, uh, like really sort of like airy, floaty kind of vocals, very like Nick Nick Drake, you know, sort of vibes. Yeah. Um, and he was opening for Moses Sumney, who is just like, who has over the past few years really blown up. Um, and I, I remember, and this is all in response to my studio. So right, I remember... Right. It's cool. This is a good yeah. story. We like cool. good stories. Good. I remember watching Moses, and I had never heard of Moses. You know, I didn't know who he was at the time. And um, then come he, to find he parted the sea, led the people. Yeah, out of right. yeah, he, he was that, that guy, stuff. right, right. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know Moses Sumney, and um, but you know, whatever. This is going to be cool, I know. And then Moses gets on stage for the sound check at at this venue called Ice House in Minneapolis, um, and it's just him, a guitar player and a bass player, no drums. He does all the percussion stuff, sort of like like live looping, or just sort of it just all kind of the percussion just sort of happened in these sort of like happenstance ways. And I remember watching Moses soundcheck and I just thought to myself, my God, if you want to get to that level and be that good, you as a, as a, I, you know, me as, as a musician, as a band leader, we need a studio, we need a room right. where we can, where we can rehearse. Because at the time I had been moving couches and chairs and kind of scooting the cat out of the way in my living room to set up the PA <laughs> and all this stuff. Right. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Just like killing ourselves um, with with that 45 minutes of setup. You're exhausted. You're cranky, you know, and you got to rehearse. And so uh, as luck would have it, we had a friend who had a little art studio in this warehouse that I just mentioned. Um, and there was a big 16 by 24 foot closet that, among other things, contained an airplane wing. Uh, <laughs> so it was of sort of just... Did. Yeah, right. So it was just like just where the landlord of, of this building like stored his junk. Um, and Ken is his name. And, and uh, Ken said, you should ask Melinda if you can rent her closet as a rehearsal space. And so I did. And here we are. Um, and you kept so the airplane wing? 
No, man, that thing had to go. <laughs> I, I'm running out of room as it is. So, um, yeah, so we, we moved into this space, I think, in, I'm going to say March of like 2018. And it's, yeah, it's like a 16 by 24 rectangle. Um, I found a bunch of, uh, it's called soundboard, I think. It's like compressed cardboard or something. I found a bunch of sheets of that at a, at a uh, like a Habitat for Humanity sort of reseller place. Slap that up on the walls, put a bunch of carpets down. Um, I've got a snake running to my Allen Heath mixer for the for the live sound. Mm-hmm. And really, for up until 2020, man, this room was just a rehearsal space. I, I didn't imagine recording here. Like it didn't occur to me that this could be a recording studio. Like, sure, I'd, I'd thrown up mics and and done some you know done some like sessions and stuff. But like, I never viewed it as good enough, right? to be right. a recording studio because and I had been... It's, yeah, a, it's right. a rectangular box, right? Basically. Yeah, it's, yeah, just a big shoe box. Yeah. Because I had I had been in the studio, you know, with, with Brett in Minneapolis and like his studio, you know, my God, he spent all this money to like perfectly treat it. Um, and here I am with like blankets and curtains and, you know, some used soundboard on the wall. Uh, and some scraps of carpet trying to make a room sound sound good. And um, but r- all that said, I love this room. It's I've got all these little low low floor lamps in here. Um, and I I just spend hours over here. Um, I've added a ton of instruments. I have a Rhodes. I've got a Juno sixty, a, uh, an upright piano, a drum set. You know, all kinds of cool stuff that just sort of like when when musicians come in here to hang out, we're we're just like you can easily get to inspiration. Okay, uh, from, give us yeah. a sense of the size. I mean, because you described it as a big closet earlier. Sure. Well, it, it was a closet in Melinda's room, but to me now, and especially with, with the like overhead lights off, it, it's, I sort of like like lose the sense of of space in here. Like it always feels bigger than it actually is. So um, I'm going to turn around and kind of look at the back of the room here. How many paces? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it might take you, um, I don't know, 40 steps to get from the front wall to the back wall. Oh, that's, uh, that's huge. That's pretty big. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's a good sized room. I mean, there's, there's enough room to have a four piece band with plenty of room like rehearsing or recording. How, um, how, how about how tall the ceiling is? I think they're eight feet. Eight feet. And then do you, is yeah. it like a suspended ceiling? So you got those sound panel things or is it just like a, a hard ceiling eight yeah it's just a, it's just a drywall right now and that's that's something that i've been like thinking about like should i get some sort of absorptive material up there or, or some diffusive material and i mean i don't know i'm you know you're just like you're you're in the thick of making records and recording and it's just sort of like if, they, if it's sounding good right now then right, why right. why change it yeah. well so t- talk about some of the room treatment things that seem to work like what was the difference between putting the compressed uh, cardboard in there, like how? Did, what change did that seem to make for you? Yes, right. So, so when we first moved in, uh, you know, it was it was just a big a big room with um, concrete floors and drywall wall and ceiling. And if you clapped sure. your hands, that reverb was like fifteen seconds. You know, <laughs> so so I was like, this will not. I I can't stand for this, man. So like a great um, echo chamber, though. Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, it's really cool when you when you walk. Out of so to get to my studio, you you know come in a door and then you go downstairs into this basement, which is just a big garage. Um, oh God, it's it's such a such a, a unique little area over here. Um, and you walk into this garage and you know there's all this reverb and all this echo slapping around the room, you know, from your footsteps and whatever. Maybe you're whistling or something. And then you walk into my room and it's sort of like like if you sort of like cover your ears a little bit, right? You know, like that sensation. Mm-hmm. That's that's sort of what happens when you walk into this room. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly a a lot more controlled. Um, it's, it's almost of an like the, when you have a space that's like that. It's almost like the debtor, the debtor, the better, right? Yeah, and and I know, yes, I mean, like for what I'm working with and, and my my like my stuff right now, like <laughs> I can always add reverb in the box. I mean, I'm I'm not too concerned about right, that, right? Um, but I have done recordings where I've thrown, you know, a, a mic out into the garage, and that's sort of your like like drum sort of room echo mic, and gotten some cool results with that. So, yeah, th- there's just a lot of um, what I like about this room, I guess, is is that it, it's a big room. I can have all my gear set up. I can have people over here, um, and we can just get to work. Yeah, and then um, didn't you say that you kind of upgraded your computer rig too? Is there anything you want to give a shout out or, or 
chat about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> Thanks to you and your podcast, I uh, and the Christmas record and all of this stuff. I uh, from I, I got an iMac Pro refurbished from uh, OWC, um, oh, nice. Other World Computing. Yeah, man, and this thing, you know, I at, up until buying this, you know very expensive, very powerful supercomputer. Um, I had been running a 2011 MacBook uh, Pro, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, like 13 inch screen. And boy, that little sucker would just, you'd hear him chugging. You'd hear him making the like, the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Whoosh. yeah. Yeah. And it, it just, I was like, man, I'm not making it. I'm not making any records on this thing anymore. Atom Audio can provide all your monitor needs. Whether you are setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class studio for professional mixing and mastering, their unique accelerated ribbon tweeter design is famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that let your speakers disappear into your music, allowing you to focus on the mix. Visit the Atom Audio YouTube channel for lots of cool free interviews, tutorials, master classes, and learn how to set up your studio monitor and control room. Just click the link in the show notes of this episode. The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia and feature the patented Golden Drop Capsule design for enhanced clarity that will give your recordings that classic vintage tone. Our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to you, Recording Studio Rockstars listeners. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the V67, V47, or the new V12 microphone at Jay-Z Microphones. Mike.com. All right. So the iMac Pro, is that a, um, give us some more details. Anything that you, I mean, if you don't remember off the top of your head, that's fine. But if you remember like, you know, which iMac Pro was that? What's the processor in it or sure. any of the can, RAM stuff, speeds, yeah. whatever you feel uh, like? Yeah. So it's, um, it's a 27 inch iMac Pro from 2017 with 32 gigs of RAM, a uh, 3.2 gigahertz, eight core Intel Xeon uh, processor, and all this other cool stuff. It's, I mean, it's like the fastest computer I've ever, I've ever used. Um, and so, I, I do a lot of film editing too. And um, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. We didn't yeah. really even talk about that. I kind of no, didn't cool. say that in the intro yet. Yeah, no, that's all right. Yeah, so like one of my other jobs is I, I work at a public access TV station, uh, and we have these computers at the station. And I was like, I got to get one of these. And, um, you know, I had money coming in from some jobs. It's uh, funny that and- you mentioned that because that's always been my experience. It's it's really rewarding when you go and you see somebody else's rig working great. And you're like, that one works. I want that, you know? Yep. Yep. That's exactly what it was. And I, I and, and and then just this year. So last year, I was also fortunate, fortunate enough to win a couple of uh, arts, arts grants. So... I won a, a regional arts council grant um, to record my solo record, and I won a state arts grant to, you know, further help my solo record stuff, which we can talk about. Um, but cool. with that, yeah, with that money, I actually also invested in uh, a 2019 um, MacBook Pro laptop. And so what I had been doing um, was hauling my big iMac over to my studio, you know, in this big Gator case, you know, for specifically made for the computer. Uh, and just about a month ago, I got the laptop and my God, I just put it in a backpack. I can walk to my studio. It's like less than a mile away from my house. And I threw the laptop down and it runs just as fast as Don't the Don't throw guy. your laptop down. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I set it down gently. <laughs> I forgot to mention and, that on previous podcast episodes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, so like last year was was a big, was basically the investment in the recording aspect of of, of my studio, of my room. Uh, what I got the computer, I got a ton of preamps and, you know, sort of stuff like that. And then this year, um, obviously, I'm continuing to invest in the studio and in my setup. But uh, with the laptop, I'm I'm a lot more like streamlined and mobile now. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, did you choose to uh, put SSDs in both of those computers? Was that a, a yes. choice you had to make? Uh, I think that if I remember correctly, the laptop was just stock with with an SSD. And mm-hmm. as far as I as far as I know, the, uh, the the big boy has one too. So yeah, so they're they're really man it's just like <laughs> i don't know what 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 you or anybody out there listening you know is currently working on but my god spending i can't believe i was able to accomplish as much as i was able to accomplish on my 2011 macbook pro i mean it like speaks speaks a lot about that computer you know about that little laptop my, my old one but mm-hmm. 
Boy, she's tired. <laughs> <laughs> she's worn up. Worn yeah. out. Um, yeah, she's done her done a job. Well, very cool. Let's see. Um, so uh, anything else about your studio? You've got the Allen and Heath mixer. You got the computer set up with your UAD interface. Um, what about microphones? What are some of the, you know, microphones that you've been excited about? And then even like, what was one of the first ones you got that that seemed to work for you? Or if you were trying to like uh, give it, the rock stars any advice on like what was great starter? Obviously, SM Seven is a great starting mic too. Or, yeah, and, yeah. Not even a starting mic. This is a great mic. Right, right. Um, yeah, so so I've got the uh, Allen and Heath for you know live. It's it's like it's just like the room like like live mixer with all the all the monitors and stuff for like rehearsing. And then the I've got um, the Apollo X H uh, and a Focusrite Claret Octo Pre. So I, I'm a 16 track studio, right? Um, right and on. I have a I <laughs> for better or worse, I I took out the uh, Sweetwater, you know, like zero percent APR, whatever, for four years kind of thing. And I've got a, I, I owe Sweetwater a, a fair amount of money, but you know, I'm making money with recording. So it's cool. Yeah. So from them, um, I have uh, a couple of preamps from Warm Audio, a Focusrite, uh, ISA2, some other goofy stuff. Um, I just picked up a Ready, the the Red DI. Oh, from, yeah. 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 It's super rad. Um, and as, as far as like mics go, I, I would say, yeah, that this SM7B was, was my first like real mic. Like prior to that, I, I had, um, you know, a couple of SM58s, some SM57s that I bought in college. Actually, my 58, I got that for my 15th birthday and it's, it's still going. So that's pretty cool. Right on. Um, yeah. Does uh, it still and- have, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stickers on it? <laughs> no, dude, no. <laughs> Come on. No. Well, okay, sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's got a little red bandana on it. You know. Um, what do you use? What yeah. like if you're going to mic up drums in your studio? Sure. Um, what, what's a way that you would choose to do that right now? Yeah. So, so I've, I've kind of got a, a, a nice little system. Um, throughout the pandemic, you know, I, I was, I was able, I was fortunate again enough to to be able to work from home. And like, you know, make make my income, right? Uh, and then we weren't driving anywhere. We weren't touring. I wasn't spending hardly any money. So at the end of every week, man, I'd have really a pretty hefty amount of money in my account. So naturally, what do you do? You you set, you know, your reverb.com uh, notifications to tell you when cool stuff pops up. So right. Every, yeah, right. It's, it's bad. So like every morning, you know, I, I would look at... I would get these notifications from Reverb. And so as far as that goes, currently uh, with drum mics, I have a pair of um, Sennheiser MD-421s that I throw on the toms. And uh, I started... Now that I have 16 channels, I can do an under snare mic, a top snare mic, you know, an, an in kick, an out kick. Um, I have a pair of uh, Cascade Fathead 2s that I use for overheads. Um, and those are just really, really cool. Um, those are the ribbons? They are, yeah. And, and you know, like everybody's like maybe they're sort of like a like quote my first ribbon mic but i don't know man they've they've been really nice and and i i don't know any different right now so they're they're really working well for me well it's funny um, because when you get into overhead sometimes um you find later that you're putting in a lot of effort trying to you know darken your overheads and stuff yeah. so it's like why why go through all that you know why why make record it way too bright and then have to mix it back to sounding like something else if you can just get it to sound like that at the beginning. Exactly. And 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 that's what led me to the um, Cascades, you know, t- t- to the uh, ribbons. I, I had been using a pair of uh, AT Audio-Technica 4040s um, for, for my room mics. And, and they're like a, a bit of a darker condenser compared to I had had a 2020. I had had an AT 2020 that was like, man, it was really sibilant after a while. Um, and the 4040s are a bit darker, but still you would just get such a like sort of nasty, like, like, like high sort of cymbal sound um, when I had those on the room mics or even as overheads. So I got the Cascades and dude, it's just like, it's just such a beautiful sound. I could just listen to the overheads, <laughs> you know? Right, right. Uh, and it's just like, man, this sounds like, like radio head drums or, or something. It's like yeah. really cool. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, so like, for example, of course, I, I talk about the Jay-Z mics a lot of, and I yeah. love, love those and they sound great and they have a h- wonderful top end and stuff. But I think one of the things that you learn is like, you may want to be selective about which instrument gets that big sound. Like, okay, we're going to save this space in our mix for the for the vocals, and therefore we we're going to use a darker mic on the overheads because we don't want the cymbals competing for all that attention, right? 
Yeah, that's exactly like what I realized. The, the more I was recording and like like just doing like disgusting amounts of EQ on on the overhead mics, you know, like really like 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 just pulling the highs all the way down with with uh you know the like I can't think I, I'm like blanking on it the uh, you know not the not the high pass but the low pass filter just right, like right. S- scraping that off. Um, and then eventually I, I was like doing all this EQ work and, you know, this is sort of before I realized like, you know, get the room sounding good, get the mics for the, use the right mics for the right job. Right. And that's kind of what I learned just recording so much all last year. I, I, I really learned like, wow, you know, certain mics do the certain, do the job well. And so I've, I've like set out to kind of, you know, acquire those mics that do the job for the specific thing. Well, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, let's see. Let's jump forward. And um, anything else about your studio we should give a shout out to? Uh, let's see. Do, what do, about do, headphones? What do what'd you decide to use for headphone mixes and things like that? How do people man, hear each other? Dude. Okay. As far as that goes. So um, I spent... <laughs> I'm just going to keep referencing last year because I did. I I recorded every day last year. And I mean, I'm not alone in doing this, I know. But like, God, when, you know, the guitar player is like, can I get a little more of this? Or the singer is like, can I get a little less of that? And you're like trying to like, like live mix for them in the headphone mix. And the headphones, you know, are coming out of, I used to just have this like, like rolls six channel headphone amplifier with like, you know, 20 or with like, you know, um, 25 foot like headphone extenders coming out of it and mm-hmm. and having to like mix for the instruments that mix for the artists on the fly it was just driving me nuts um because you were you were trying to be a player at the same time also and be able to play along um no, or were you just being an engineer in those i was just engineering yeah i was engineering and then you know the, the the artists would be like i can't hear myself can you give me more of this less of that blah 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 so just at the beginning of this year i invested in a hearback uh pro system. So I have four of those hearback headphone mixers, which run over ethernet. And I, you know, the more gear I get, the, I just like, I have like these like infatuation periods with the gear, you know? Yeah. And like with these headphone mixers, I, I was, I was telling Laura, you know, my wife, like, like, babe, I don't know how to describe to you how much I love these things. <laughs> but all you know, right. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Keep telling us about them. Yeah. What, what, um, did you ever use the the here the original hearbacks and how did the the pro newer ones compare to those? Actually, I I, I may have misspoken. These are the original hearbacks. Oh, they're so, the original ones. Okay, yeah, great. yeah, yeah. So they sort of have like a sort of odd kind of rectangular with the sort of like biomorphic kind of shape to them. Um, how, well, I used him in the studio when we were recording our our the, when we recorded our pair of records with the guy in Minneapolis. You know, he he had the same setup, so I always like clocked those as something that I should probably get at some point in my life. Um, and when I had the money all of a sudden because of these jobs, it was like, well, why not? Um, so yeah, I, I sourced out four of them. So what's awesome about those is that uh, basically you can through like bus sends and stuff like that, you can send like like the drums to one channel of the mix of, of the headphone mixer, the music to one channel, like a, a live mix so the artist can hear themselves. And then, you know, the click track is like basically how, how I route the headphone mixer um, so mm-hmm. that the artist can like mix. So the artist then is in control of their own headphone mix, right? And uh, if it sounds bad, it's it's on them and not on me. So it's <laughs> just like, right? This like really, really, really takes away uh, that added like anxiety and that added like sort of distraction right from recording where you just get the level set send the right things to the headphone mixer and the artist can just sort of rock it from there and i've been using these for the past month i've I've had some clients in here um and i i'd never hear anybody say can i get more of this can i get less of that uh and their performance is they're able to focus more in on their performance you know which which is ultimately what we're after yeah that's great The STX100D from the Spectra 1964 Custom Shop is the big brother to the now famous STX100, a fully discrete mic pre with dual transformer isolated Spectra 101 amplifiers. The STX100D is exactly the same original circuit found in Stax, Arden, AdVision, AM, and Record Plant recording consoles. The sonic performance is identical. Best of all, it will plug into a single space of your standard 500. 
500 Lunchbox. And if you want to add the sound of the famous Spectra C610 complimenter, then check out the new STX600 modules, combining the STX100 mic pre and C610 into a single 500 module. Now you can get the same incredible sound in your studio that worked for famous producers like Tom Dowd with the STX mic pre's BBDI and complimenters. Go to spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. I love using Isotope plugins for my music and podcast productions. In fact, you're hearing Ozone and RX on my voice in this podcast episode. And now you can get access to all the Isotope plugins through the new subscription bundle. For only $19.99 per month, Music Production Suite Pro is designed for the serious recording, mixing, and mastering engineer, putting the finishing touches on music, film, and podcasts with fully pro versions of Ozone, RX, Neutron, Nectar, Neoverb, Tonal Balance Control, Visual Mixer, and more, including free plugin updates. And just for you rock stars, get an extended 30-day free trial subscription at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscription. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Colin Scharf joining us from Mankato, Minnesota, land of lakes, where it's funny because I think about it and it's like all those lakes. When I see lakes, I think, oh, what a great place to swim. And then I realized that mostly you guys just go skating on them in the winter, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> awesome, dude. Boy, are you ready yeah. to jam? Kick it off? You know it, man. You know it. You know it. All right. So tell us about um, this compilation record, You know, this wonderful success story of working with all the local musicians, getting an arts grant to put this out. I think, well, I, I might be conflating some of the different stories here, but um, yeah. is it the Yuletide collection of Mankato music? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, f for the past few years, I'd say for the past like eight years or so, I've, I've been a freelance writer for the, uh, for the local newspaper, the, the free press of Mankato. Um, and my editor at the paper is, is this man named Rob Murray, uh, great dude, great music lover, really good supporter of like local music and local arts. Um, and I think it was like November of 2019, uh, Rob, you know, texted me or whatever. And he's like, Hey, we have this idea to put together a compilation album of, you know, Mankato musicians playing holiday music, uh, and, and use it as a fundraiser. Uh, you know, and then he's like, how do we do it? And I said, let's have a beer. <laughs> there you go. That's <laughs> so, always how you start it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we met up and we went to this little bar called the wine cafe and, uh, I'm just giving all kinds of shout outs here. And, um, no problem. Yeah, we, we're sitting there and, you know, he, he says like, I, well, I basically said like, Rob, we can do it one of two ways. You know, you can have the artists record themselves and maybe get good results and or maybe get pretty like mixed results. Right. Because like there isn't a well, one, there isn't like an official recording studio like in Mankato. There isn't like a like, you know, you go into the room and it's got all the mics in the console. There's just like me and a handful of other cats like with their sort of cobbled together rigs. Um, and so, you know, anyway, there, there wouldn't be any way for like somebody outside to like to have helmed it. So I said, or mm -hmm. you could pay me <laughs> to make this thing happen. And he was like, sounds good. How much do you want? And I threw him nice. a number and he threw me another number. And I said, okay, that's fine. You're like, so, we can do this one of two ways. We can do it my <laughs> way or the highway. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, you know. And so, yeah, I, I you know, signed the contract. I uh, got the down payment. Uh, and invested in some gear, took out the Sweetwater card, you know, all that stuff I mentioned earlier. Um, and then, yeah, man, then uh, the pandemic hit. And I, I think it was like March when everything kind of shut down. And, you know, by April, it was like, I, I don't know if this is going to happen. I was I was messaging Rob like, yo, man, like, are we going to do this? Like, what's going on? And he's like, I'm, I don't know. And yeah. I, you know, was talking to the artists and saying like, hey, do you still feel comfortable with this? And everybody was sort of like on the fence. Um, but really, by about mid-May, um, by the end of last May is, is when I did the first session. Uh, awesome. And yeah, it was like, and man, it was so cool. Um, and really, I just spent the May 
like the end of May until I, I, I delivered, I sent the final like master to uh, the pressing plant in Minneapolis um, on, I think like November 3rd, <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. So like I, I spent from May to November, like at least once, a, at least once a week, three times a week, however many times a week recording, producing, I spent all of October like mixing. Um, and you know, what was really, really cool about the record, uh, is that these artists hadn't played in months. And when a new group would show up, you know, we would get going, get cooking, get rehearsing and, and, and playing and stuff. And at least somebody or everybody from the group would, would say like, man, this feels so good to play. Like I haven't been on a stage. I feel like we're like, we're, we're performing here, you know? So like, not only was it, not only were we like making cool music and sort of capturing fun performances and things like that, but like the artists themselves were, were like having a chance to like be themselves again. Um, and that, that was like a, something that we didn't consider. <laughs> we didn't know that that's where we were going to be at when we first went in on this. Um, but you think adventure. it was partly because of the way that you set up everybody in one room like that and gave them their own headphone mixes that they just felt like, Oh, this feels like a good performance. Yeah. 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 I'm, you know, like it, yeah, it, all, <laughs> All of that, yeah. Just, just, just being able to like sit in a room with your guitar, with your vocals on your drum kit, and these are for all the artists that were playing, and and just to like play the song, man. They, they just, they, just about every one of them told me just like how good it felt to be able to play with a purpose again. Yeah. Now, yeah. one of the tracks in the um, playlist that I've got for you is um, it's Good Night Gold Dust doing Oh Holy Night. Was that from the record, or was that a previous recording? That was uh, like oddly enough. We work so oddly, my 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 band. Like <laughs> that was the last song that we recorded. I think I did it in like three days. It was like Laura, we gotta we gotta track this song. You know, I I had the backing track kind of mixed and all this stuff, and you know, it, it's all MIDI stuff and 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 yeah. like MIDI synths and everything. And and Laura comes over, she, she does like two vocal takes, I think, and we were like, that sounds good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thinking that's gonna be the scratch track, and we'll we'll get her back in here when when it's more like you know, more ambient and get the candles and stuff going. And and that just never happened. <laughs> so thankfully she's like a great and a great singer. So like her, her kind of first, first couple of takes there were ended up being the, you know, the thing for the album, uh, yeah. for the track. Um, but so that, no, yeah, we, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that one starts out with this, uh, I listened to it in the studio and it starts out with just like this deep sub coming out of nowhere, you know? Yeah. And I realized it's one of the cool things about, a lot of the productions you're doing, you're doing live recordings, but you're also working with programmed sounds and you seem to have a real appreciation for just getting great sounds doing it that way. Um, what, what were some of your thoughts about that deep sub? And then, you know, how do you check something like that in your mix just to make sure you got it right? And I think you maybe had a really cool vocoder effect going on that one too. And I wonder if you want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So that that deep sub was was a gamble, I think. Um, I have a, a hi-fi system at home. It was my gr grandfather's, like you know, 1984 like technique system with with a big you know floor speakers with the three ways, awesome. you know, big huge sub, and that on the reference mix, that that sub like kicked, uh, you know, <laughs> and I'm I'm like mixing on Adam's on on Adam uh, A7Xs and oh cool. You know, yeah, they they have a they have a really pretty pretty nice like presentation of of low end and so like the sub all with that intro sub always sounded like good to me uh, obviously and headphones was able to recreate it too um, and I remember hearing it though like in my car <laughs> and I was like oh wait a minute where's the sub there were just right. a couple times and a couple different systems where I was like maybe it wasn't a good idea to start out with such a such a subby sub because I do think it got lost. I didn't notice it until I listened to it down in the studio. I think I right. first heard it on earbuds or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So the song, so like, I remember um, 89, I'm going to reference 89.3 The Current again. They they were on their, um, their, like, they do a local show every Sunday where they play like all local artists, right? And I had emailed them, hey, we made this Christmas record, you know, would you, would you consider maybe, you know, promoting it or whatever? And they said, sure, send us some tracks and we'll, we'll spin them. So our our contact there, uh, Andrea Swenson, she you know she spun a couple tracks. Among them, 
our whole oh, holy night. And when it first came on, it was like three or four, maybe five seconds of what sounded kind of like dead air. But I think <laughs> right. it was just that it was just sub. that sub. And I was like, God, why did I do that? Oh, oh no. that's so funny. The yeah. things we learn when we get to hear our music on the radio. I had a yeah. track that I did for a local band, and we had done it. I had done like a single mic on the drums, and it was like this kind of it was a very, very like intimate recording and it had this great feel for it but there was some spaces in the middle where there was like a pause before the band started again and in the studio i never really thought anything of the noise because i was just like it just sound you know i'm used to like hearing tape noise or hearing a little bit of noise on the vocal mic and it just sounded cool right yeah. but then listening to it on the radio i was listening and the radio compressor brought up that that you know, pause in the middle of the song. Yeah. And it just took all that noise and it was just like, yeah. and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, it's like I've, you know, last year I sent, I, you know, produced and mixed a handful of singles for, for gold dust. And, and I, you know, again, sent them to the, to the radio in Minneapolis and they played them on the local show. And it was always like, like, like biting my nails for the song to come on and hoping to, you know, to whoever's out there that it would sound good through the radio. Right. And that was one where I was like, oh man, boy, I wish I could get that one back. But regardless, I think, you know, the song is freaking cool. Um, I I really love uh, at, the, at the end of the track, you know, when like all the instruments cut out and Laura's voice just sort of like flies above the mix. It's just like, actually, uh, this is a good story. Um, I, I brought Rob over to listen to the like final mixes, right? And we listened to the whole album. We were like doing the sequencing of it. And <laughs> Rob is here and Laura was here and we were all hanging out in the, in the studio. And we got to that. We listened through the whole song and <laughs> I'm getting a little emotional thinking about it. But we, we listened to that song and when, when the music cuts out and it's just Laura's voice like soaring above the, above the track, you know, then the track ends. I turn over. Rob is just like, red eyed tears streaming down his face and he stands up and he just gives Laura this huge hug. And and I was like, I think we did something right with that one. That's groovy. That's yeah, pretty cool. Really cool. That's yeah. great. Um, you know, when you're talking about hearing it on the radio and, and hoping it sounds good, it reminds me of a story I heard about Rick Rubin where he, um, uh, what's the, um, K rock is the station in LA. Yeah. And that was always like, you know, that was like the, it, this has to sound great on K rock to know that it sounds great. And he ended up, I heard that he bought the same radio compressor that K rock uses so that he could have that in the studio so that he could use that to reference mixes to double check it. And I was like, that's yeah. pretty cool. And it just reminds me, um, all of us really of this idea of, you know, considering like, where is this going to get heard? You know, how do we check our mixes? How do we reference stuff to make sure that it sounds right on, in all the right places? Um, so I'll pivot back. Do you have any, um, you know, you mentioned using the Atom A7Xs. Uh, maybe tell us what, what, how those monitors work for you. And then do you have other monitors that you like to go, other ways that you go check your mixes? Yeah, yeah. So for for a long time, I I was just mixing on like M Audio B A Xs or whatever they are. They're like little like five inch horns and yeah. or, you know woofers. Just fine, fine studio, fine like budget level things. And I didn't know any different, man. Like uh, my friend, a friend of mine who is like just a huge collector of of studio gear. He's got all kinds of great stuff. Like you know every like U eighty seven. He's got like all the all the uh, all the great compressors and LA two A you know eleven seventy six all this really rad stuff. Um, he he's like I got a pair of NS tens you know and this is like six or eight years ago mm -hmm. and I was like cool what are those I had no idea uh, at the time and he's like check them out man and he's like playing music through them and he's like it sounds so good doesn't it and I was like in my head I'm like I don't know what he's hearing but this sounds like crap <laughs> um, so you know what I mean so like so I didn't know any different until I got the atoms. And then I was like, holy shit. Uh, wow. These are, these are, this is like a real deal. And I, I do have to credit my, my friend and former bandmate Zach, um, for like encouraging me to get the atoms. I, I was like, I'm doing this Christmas record. I know I need to upgrade. What speaker should I get? And he's like, dude, don't, don't fuck around. Right. Like get, just get these, like the guys that we work with have them in their home studios. Um, just get them. You won't look back. And 
what I learned about those speakers, I think right off the bat is that I was like, I can't quite remember, but they had, they have like a, like a dip in the upper mids, I think. So you think, so you think you have to push the, the like, like, like 4k that zone kind Mm -hmm. of, you think you have to push it more, but it's actually like sort of dipped out. So for a long time, I was like really making these like kind of like bright, harsh mixes. You and were I, I was overcompensating it. I first, was, yeah. And God, man, like you're just trying to figure this stuff out like on your own, using your own ears. And and I, I just kind of loop back to like having really no other point of reference than what's in front of you. Um, it It definitely took me a while to kind of get the swing of those speakers, but I think I can kind of feel them now. Like I kind of get what they're doing and yeah. and what what to do. And also like watching the meters and things like that. Like where's the EQ kind of coming up and where is it looking weird? Um, and sort of going back and forth between, you know, what I'm hearing in the room and then my my like monitoring kind of stuff on on the software. Um and are were they seven inch cones? Is that what they that are, what? yeah. Yep. Yep. So yep. you so I think one of the things you have to learn, unless you're going to try and integrate with the sub, then you learn that you listen for low end differently. Like you're not trying to judge sub subs necessarily. You're trying to hear what happens just above that, for example. Yeah. I think, right? Yep. 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 Or I don't know, you tell me what, what, um, you know, what parts of your mix, like, are you, um, you said when you got home with the big subs, that's when you heard in the Oh Holy Night, that sub intro, would you hear that on a near field monitor, like the A7Xs, or would you sort of just wait and go check that afterwards? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it was so... I did that song so fast, you know, that I don't quite remember all. I, I, I must have thought it sounded good, you know, on on the Adams because otherwise I don't think I, I would have left it in there. Um, well, it so, does. I mean, it sounds yeah. great on the other speakers I listened to. Yeah, it. right, right. I just, yeah, I just remember like it really kind of not translating to all different kind of playback things. But um, yeah, I, I think as far as low end goes, like, like I just sort of... Um, I mean, to, to be fully honest, and I'm, I'm feeling this like sort of imposter syndrome kind of thing right now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like I just try to get it where it sounds like thick and sort of like good, <laughs> I guess, to my ear. Right. Um, but not like like woofy and not sort of like 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 there's a blanket over some 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 right. element of the low end. Um, I'm I just finished a mix of this hip hop for this hip hop artist uh, in in town. And um, he sent me, you know, like the two track track that he, I think he, he like bought from some producer, you know, on, on the internet. Um, and then he, he did all, all the rap and stuff over it, you know, did all of his parts on top of that. And, and I, I remember thinking like, do I need to EQ this track? Like it's already produced. Somebody already signed off on this track. Um, and I, I like, for some reason, like rolled off a ton of low end, and I was playing it back, and I was like, "Why does this sound so gross?" <laughs> and then I, I opened up the EQ on on the on the two track, uh, and I was like, "Oh, because I've I've got a high pass filter up to like a hundred. Like, what am I doing?" <laughs> so I notched that back to like twenty, you know, around yeah, there. Yeah. And you kind of get that punch. You get that like that under punch kind of like warmth, the like the woof woof kind of kind of bit. Yeah. And you know, I brought it home and I referenced it on on you know again my my hi-fi sort of speakers, and I was like, man, this freaking kicks. This is cool. Talk um, about talk about yeah. um uh, high pass filters or low cuts. You know, what are some things that you've learned about how to use them now? Um, do you remember discovering them for the first time and thinking like, wait, I'm going to take low end out of something, and then finding out that oh wait, this can actually make my low end sound better. Yeah, yeah, that was a revelation. I remember, you know, doing some like late night YouTube, like, like, you know, dive. And suddenly I, I find this thing uh, that was like subtractive EQ. And I was like, what the hell is that? Right. Uh, you know, this, this again is a, is a long time ago. And, and I, I watched this guy talk about, yeah, like, don't boost, cut. And it just like clicked because, you know, we always talk about making room, right, for for instruments. And um, that was a revelation to me at the time. Um, just kind of really as, as a hobbyist recording guy, just more like making demos, you know, than making finished products. Like up until recently, my, my whole aim with recording really was just to get the ideas down, kind of like experiment, see how this part sounds, see how that part sounds with some 
effects on it or whatever. But now I'm at the point, you know, where I'm like trying to make stuff sound good and make stuff translate to different playback systems. Um, and so, yeah, learning about how to make room for instruments uh, and really starting with with that high pass filter um, is is like makes such a world of difference. Um, for a long time, I my mix is my buddy Zach. He's like my sort of go to guy for for my my mix references, and he would say like these are really dark, you know. And I I just I didn't know what what does that mean. And then mm -hmm. he sort of explained, and and then I learned about like rolling off certain instruments roll off the kick drum to maybe 40 hertz roll off the bass guitar to like you know i don't know 80 or so around there uh cut up to 200 maybe on like a vocal maybe not that far up but um really just like learning how to to like shave off the crap that doesn't need to that doesn't need to be there right um, right yeah well, well i feel like the the um thing that's hard to grasp at first is that rolling off low end actually can make the low end sound bigger because you because it brings things forward and you get more clarity and it's like you begin to enjoy hearing the low end I, it's a weird thing you know it's like at first we just think oh you just got to have low end everywhere and then and then you know you might even try and boost it and then everything just sounds muddy so nothing gets brought forward so nothing actually sounds like it's got big low end yeah yeah exactly yeah i i really can really I'm, I'm like listening now and sort of like like yeah basically like listening for where like the phrase like a you know quote like tight low end right like I, I kind of have a better concept of what that means now after you know doing so much like recording and mixing over the past couple of well year or so yeah. um yeah, like like there's a point where where your your kick drum or your bass guitar is you can hear the sort of fundamental, I guess, the transient or whatever. That's sort of like the initial point of 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 attack, right, of of the instrument. But then you also get all this sort of like, in my head, I see it as sort of like a purple, like sort of fuzzy orb <laughs> around the <laughs> note, you know. And you sort of like roll up that that uh, that filter until that that sort of orb starts to kind of get shaved off a little bit. And then you get that clarity, you get that, that tightness and that, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a, that That's was kind cool. of a revelation for me. Yeah. That's cool. Um, you know, I forgot to ask you, uh, to share an inspirational quote. I mean, um, oh, yeah. I don't know if you got anything that you want to share or if there's anybody that has inspired you, um, on the podcast or elsewhere. Uh, boy, it, I, I, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's all kinds of quotes, man. I, I, I made a little list here actually. Sure, um, go for it. One of the biggest things that, and like th this might translate the most, you know, for like, if you're listening or, uh, you know, for people listening, like I remember we were doing our second record, we were recording our second album, um, in, in Minneapolis. And, you know, I, I was going on about all oh, all these bands are doing these things and, and people are touring and, and all we're, you know, we're, we're not doing as much as what these other people are doing. And, and like, you know, I, I feel like I'm not doing enough. Um, and our, the guy we were working with, you know, Brett, he just said like, man, you can't worry about that stuff. You just got to keep your head down and, and keep moving, you know? And that, that really sort of has stuck with me in a way um, to kind of make me think like, yeah, I might not. I personally might not have the like, you know, ten thousand dollar, fifty thousand dollar like studio rig, right? But like, I'm making records. I'm making recordings for people. I'm feeling excited about them. They're feeling excited about them, and I just I can't let myself worry, right, about what other people are doing um, and yeah. like well, how they're going about doing things, uh, because if I start worrying about that stuff, then I won't work. And I yeah. can't, I can't do that. I can't afford to do that. You know, that kind of reminds me of something that Steve Albini said on a session once where he was like, you know, you can't try and make a record, um, that you think other people want to hear or something like that. It's like, you know, if you worry about, if you're trying to make a record that you think the record label will like, it's just going to be crap. You know, it's like, it's that same idea of like, you just have to do what's right for what you're doing and let everything else kind of fall into place. Now, with that said, yeah, yeah you might want to play the dance number if the audience at your live show looks like they're ready to get up out of their seats, but <laughs> it's a little different, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's such a... It, it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm reading this, this, uh, this book of... It's, it's a poetry handbook. I'm, I'm, I'm in the thick of it right now. It's, it's a book by, by Mary Oliver, because it's National Poetry Month right now. Uh, not to date the podcast, sorry. But... Um, 
uh, that what, there's this, a, a, send, a, a bit in that book that echoes exactly what you just said. And, and she writes, and I reread it last night because I thought it might come up today. Um, she, she writes something to the effect of, uh, con- like if you're trying to make contemporary sounding you know, art, whatever it may be, poetry or, or music, you're, you're basically looking at what's happening around you, right? And you're just trying to copy that. Um, and what, what she was saying is what you should be doing is looking back in time and trying to like expand on what's already happened instead of trying to make something sound like, you know, uh, what's happening right now because it'll mm-hmm. just be dated. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And, you yeah. know, it's fun to look back on, on history and kind of recycle things and reuse things. And, you know, one of the things that we do a lot of, um, Chris King has been a guest on the podcast. He's the singer that I've worked with for decades and decades. I'm going back to college. And we do a thing now with with groups of friends called the the uh, POSCO, which is the Poetry Scores Challenge, oh, cool. which, you know, it's basically just finding poems and saying like, well, let's, let's, you know, share these around and turn these into songs. And so it kind of, it removes a little bit of the pressure of having to um, say something personally too, and just saying like, well, I'll just start with this as a as a thing, a starting place, you know, let, let write a song around this, this is the lyric, um, which I guess is a tri- it's a pivot from what you just said, but it's still just that idea of going back and borrowing so that you create kind of a framework for which to move forward. And um, who was it? I was just talking to somebody on the podcast. We were talking about the, um, you know, the importance of creating boundaries in art to guide us in creating art, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I was just, yeah, I, I love everything you just said. I, I, when I'm like in the middle of, so Laura and I started doing this thing a few years ago called the like two hour songwriter night where nice. we give ourselves, we give ourselves two hours and we would always invite, you know, uh, uh, another songwriting friend or one of our bandmates over. And we, and that sort of having that third person there kind of like, like gave us an, uh, like a, a boost of sort of like, oh man, we, we got to really impress the, the, the new person here. Right. Yeah. So we would lock ourselves into our various home offices and, and different rooms in our house. And we would give ourselves approximately two hours to write and record a full song. Um, and a lot of the songs on the solo record that, that I'm currently recording for myself, uh, came out of those two hour sessions. And actually I think every song on, Goodnight Gold Dust's uh, second album, It Could Have Been You, came out of those two-hour songwriting sessions. Um, but w- what I do, you know, I, I study poetry. I have a master's in creative writing. Um, but when it comes to lyrics for me, they, they don't always like flow just like water, right? Sometimes I'm like, I have three words and I'm like, okay, what's the next word? You know, like mm-hmm. what rhymes with orange? I have no idea. Right. Uh, what rhymes with quashed? I have no idea. Um uh, so to, to echo what you just said, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll have like books of poetry and novels scattered all over my desk, and I'll comb those for lines, and I always find something out out of that. And I think like when I'm like writing music, I'll I'll, I'll be listening to like Radiohead or or you know a lot of times Radiohead because they're freaking cool, um, and just sort of like how can I take what they're doing and sort of make it into something new or just use it as a point of inspiration. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, just on a previous podcast, I was talking with Q about working with rap artists in the studio. Um, you know, like listening to Eminem's records, I'm just thinking like, there are so many words in these, you know, yeah. there's just so much lyrical content that goes into something like this. I'm, I'm always amazed, but Q is pointing out how some people, you know, just get on the mic and they might just, uh, you know, they might just um, um, mumble, like just just create, like just go for the rhythm of the sounds of words, and then go back in and find the words to replace those rhythms and sounds. And I think that's a cool way to work too. In fact, when I'm doing poetry scores writing with Chris mm. and my friends, sometimes I'll take the poem and like I'll I'll sketch out a a musical idea first, and then I'll go back in. And I'll just hold the poem up in front of me and I'll just sing. And like my first thoughts about how it might go in there, I try not to second guess those, like record yeah. those and then go back. And instead of going like, oh, well, I, I didn't get that right. I screwed that up. Obviously, I, like I messed up how to do this. I go, all right, well, wh- I was trying to do something there. So why don't I just make that thing work now? And I'll re-record those, those bits and make stuff fit. And it's kind of cool. It works pretty well. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I I think um, the Beatles yesterday was scrambled eggs. 
for a while until <laughs> Paul McCartney was like scrambled eggs yesterday. Oh, that, that makes more sense. Like it was a placeholder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's like, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot of value in your first ideas too. Yeah, definitely. Look, every studio needs a good vintage mic for that classic warm sound. Whether you're looking for those airy highs, sweet mid-range, or silky low end, a good vintage mic can put the magic in your mixes. So it's no wonder vintage mics have been loved and praised by thousands of engineers for decades. The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia using only the best electronic components and feature the patented Golden Drop capsule design for great detail and richness of tone that will bring that classic vintage vibe to your studio and be a real workhorse for your sessions. This time, our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to you, Rockstars. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Vintage Series mics V67, V47, and the new V12 at jayzmic.com. Adam Audio designs monitors with a mission to bring accuracy, transparency, and high definition to your studio, guiding you each step of the way on your journey from starting out in a home studio to installing your ultimate mixing setup in your pro studio. Check out their complete line of speakers and headphones from the T-Series to the AX-Series to their top-of-the-line S-Series, which all use the unique ART-accelerated ribbon tweeter design, famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that let your speakers disappear in into your music. Want to feel awesome to make brilliantly accurate creative decisions in your mixes because you can finally hear your music clearly? Your ears are the greatest instrument you have, and if you can hear the music, then you can mix the music. Visit the Atom Audio YouTube channel for lots of cool free interviews, tutorials, master classes, and learn how to set up your studio monitors and control room. Just click the link in the show notes of this episode. Tell us, give us some other sure. stuff. Like, what have you learned... Um, from the creative writing process that translates into creating music that we can really have as a takeaway? Yeah, um, I think, okay, so let me, I, I had some some stuff to say about this. Let me like organize my mind here. Um, I recently came across an article that was talking about the, you know, the like 10,000 hours idea, yeah. right? Like you spend 10,000 hours on whatever your craft is and then you are a certified master or something in the craft, right? So... I, I got to thinking like I've I've been doing home rec I've been I've been playing with microphones and recording things since I was like 15, right? Right. Um. So I probably have amassed about 10,000 hours, but I haven't amassed like a I guess focused right 10,000 hours, and so I'm still learning. Um. And things are still like coming to me, and I'm still like you know very open and sort of in that in sponge mode, right? Where like I'm still absorbing information. Um. I I had initially wanted to go to school, go to uh, college for sound recording. And I was going to go to, um, uh, I was going to go to the program at, at SUNY Fredonia where uh, Dave Fridman is the sort of like boss. Oh, right, right of, on. Yeah, I know. Right. Um, and I just like, didn't, I just couldn't get into the program. I couldn't get into the music program. I, I didn't, I guess, try hard enough, whatever. Um, and so that was fine because I also have a, a great deep and a great passion, right, for for literature and for reading and, and writing, especially. Um, and so, like, I studied writing all the way through undergrad and all the way into grad school. Um, and at the same time, I was making music and writing music and um, studying like visual art and and studying filmmaking and poetry. And I don't know, man. There's just I I I don't know. I, I guess I don't quite have an answer. Um, like a, a just mix a it all up. I mean, yeah, because we haven't even talked about it. But you're making movies. You you've made like horror films, and you've done lots of short films and stuff like that too, right? Yeah, and and they they all just like feed each other in all these sort of unique ways. Like I'm not thinking about like iambic pentameter, you know, Shakespeare when I'm miking a kick drum, right. <laughs> <laughs> but like I think that there's something about learning, learning maybe like like. Uh, pacing, you know, how to like pace a story, how to, how to pace a poem, uh, or, or like a, a film scene, maybe even, um, so that you're, because I think like, like a lot of people, like their first impression is to just like everything in at the top, slam it out the whole way through, bang, 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 you yeah. know, this is rock and roll. Right. And you're like, yeah, 
but like that's already happened. So like, how can we think in new ways about like making a song sound interesting and sound cool? How can we make the arrangement like unique, right? Right. And, and why do we want to do that? I mean, I, I, on a very basic level, it's because you just want to hold the listener's attention. Yeah, and 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 that's something that like that like the artists I've been working with lately, like we we talk a lot about. You know, you don't need a harmony here yet. Let's hold that harmony for this part of of the verse, or or yeah. what if the acoustic, what if everything drops out but the acoustic guitar, or everything drops out but the drums, or you know whatever, like those sorts of moves. That yeah, like if if you're you know listening to music and you're paying attention to music in those critical ways, like you're going to like come to those sort of you know maybe maybe you're going to get to those those like ideas you know that way. But there's something about like. I don't know. And maybe I'm just sort of like reaching here, but I, I, I'm very thankful for the, the amount of support and the amount of like, um, like, like, uh, multi genre, like artistry, I guess that I've like mm-hmm. been able to explore, uh, as, 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 you know, as, as a guy here. Well, I mean, uh, you know, just the way you describe Mankato and getting the art grants and everything, um, it made me think that other other than, you know, the issue of being buried under 20 feet of snow for most of the year, it sounds like <laughs> artistic heaven up there. It's really cool, man. Like, New, I mean, obviously, I, I mentioned I'm, I'm from New York State originally, um, and New York City is freaking cool. I, I always wanted to live there. Um, I, I love where I grew up. It's really beautiful. Uh, it's really like scenic sort of town. But um there's just something about the support for the arts in Minnesota. Uh, we we have it written into our state constitution that a percentage of tax dollars, you know, go toward arts funding, and oh, I think that great. that's just so cool. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, um, let's see. Um, one of the things that we didn't finish on was uh, in the uh, Oh Holy Night. You were I mentioned that there was a vocoder part. I thought um, was that true? And is there anything you want to talk about? how you get some of those cool vocoder effects in your production. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, Laura and I picked up a pair of TC Helicon Voice Live Play, I think, threes to the little blue boxes. And, you know, you can set like auto-tune, you can set like harmonies and things like that. And I don't know, you know, you can you can like overuse them, um, <laughs> certainly. And I've seen bands where they're just like on the whole time and it's a little like, okay, like we get it, vocoder, cool. Right. Um, but... <laughs> But I, I do think that, I don't know, I just, I love the way that I feel when I hear a voice sort of like intermittently through mm-hmm. that effect on a recording. Like you think about like um, Bon Iver's like 20 to a million. Uh, the third track is um, like 715 Creeks, I think it's called. And it's just him singing through this like invention that he and his producer Chris Messina made uh, called the Messina. And it's just the whole song is just him vocals through this vocal processing thing. Uh, you think about Imogen Heap's um, freaking hide and seek, right? Like just the the alienness of that sound and the the like beauty of it. It's so cool. And so you know, not to like like copy, I guess, not to like um, sort of like try to be that sort of artist or that kind of stuff. Um, I think when you use it, you know, sparingly use it as an effect, it it can really kind of like shake you out of. Uh, maybe what's happening in the song. So, um, well, so just just yeah. to geek out on the tech of it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's cool is that you're talking about a a box that's like a guitar pedal, but you plug your vocal mic into it, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. is this one of these things where if you play the chord on the guitar, it's, it sort of recognizes that and adjusts your vocal to follow the guitar chord, or um, how does any of that work? You can set it so that the like internal mic of 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 the box is like listening, you know, and then it, the 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 mic will tell the box what key the song is in. Really, it just hears it playing in the speakers through the room, kind of thing. Yeah, it's so I I don't use it that way. The 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 other like sort of safer way to play it is to um set set the patches for each song to the key of the song. Right. Uh, and so like you know if you're singing out of key because that thing is like you hear that sort of out of out of key auto tune kind of thing. Um, so to that effect it sort of helps you like be a better singer in a way because it's always kind of keeping you on pitch. Um, but for recording, uh, I think I probably used Sound Toys um, little Alter Boy for that. Oh cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. And then have you so if Sound Toys Little Alter Boy, in other words, you're just suggesting that, but is it following chord changes somehow? Or do you ever do the thing where you like hook up a MIDI keyboard and play chords and sing through a mic and create a sound that way? 
boy, I, I, I wish I could play the keyboard that well, <laughs> but no. And actually, I think I misspoke. I think I use Waves Ovokes. Oh, okay. For, All right. That's one of yeah, the new ones. Yeah. 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 That thing is really cool. It's, it's a little like kind of can go haywire if you hit the wrong button, but like I, I've used, I use that a lot last year, man. I really like that plugin. Awesome. Um, well, let's see here. Go, uh, good night, gold dust, better gone. Um, I believe that was the track title. Uh, great sounding record, super punchy drums. Um, and then also I noticed that generally you've got some pretty great keyboard sounds and you, um, let me see, I made a note about another one of these. I think second moon has got some really nice sort of swimmy introductory, you know, intro keys on the song. And I wonder if you wanted to talk about some of the ways that you've been able to, you know, use keyboards with that cool sound. It's like, it's like modern, but they're also kind of like warping and swimming around and stuff in a cool way. Yeah. 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 So, so, my like like knowledge of synths and, and, and synthesizers like you know really comes from uh, our our former bandmate Zach who who joined the group in 2014 and really helped us like kind of find a new sound. Um, prior to Zach being in the group, we were like a four piece kind of like folk rock kind of thing, and then we had this mm -hmm. like lineup change. We were a three piece sort of ambient swimmy thing, and then Zach joined the group on synth, and he's like you know, introduce this like synth element. So when we went to record uh, in, in the cities, you know, um, Zach and and the the guy that we worked with spent a lot of time getting synth tones. And I I was just sort of like hanging out in the background, kind of watching. I, I feel a little funny about um, like, as I think back on those on those recording sessions, like I, you know, we were working with like a, a world class guy. I mean, this this guy that we worked with for those two records was like so good. Um, and I, I wish I, I almost wish I could like go back and just like ask more questions of him. And right. Like, what is that? What are you doing? What's this here? You know? Um, but like, I, I was so focused on, you know, the songs as the artist, right. And sort mm -hmm. of like making sure that all of our stuff was, was like, was, was right. As opposed to, you know, geeking out about the gear and things like that. But, um, you know, through Zach and through like working with Brett up in the up in the cities in Minneapolis, uh, they call them the cities out here. <laughs> um, yeah, we were the yeah, twin we, cities. The twin cities. I know. When I moved out here, it was like you go into the cities, and I was like, "What's that mean?" <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, Zach was playing a Nord, and then I don't know, man. I mean, you just sort of like learn attack, decay, sustain, release. You kind of figure out like how how the filter works <laughs> on all that stuff. Um, that's cool. So Brett is yeah. so Brett was um doing a lot of the mixing and stuff like that on those records. He did everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. He's like, yeah, he 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 produced all that stuff. We'll yeah, chase him down too. What do you say? Dude, you should. He's he's the man. I I I feel like you should be talking to him and <laughs> not me. But. No, no, it's totally cool <laughs> yeah. though. Um, you yeah, know, yeah. what about uh so let's pivot that back. Sure. What a, what were some of the things you learned about um, you know, being really effective in the studio where you're the artist and you're, you're handing over the reins to another engineer or producer. Um, any, any thoughts about that? Um, as far as what really seemed to work well, as far as other ways where you were, you know, shooting yourself in the foot by accident? Yeah. Well, I can certainly speak to how working with bread in the studio translated to like me, you know, working with artists in, in Mankato. So when we went in to work with him for the first record, we, we were just like so green, you know, we, we, we had been a band for five years. So like in our heads, we were like, well, we know what we're doing. You know, we, we know these songs, we know our sound, blah, blah, blah. And then Brett's like, okay, like we're, we're going to make a, a record. You guys ready to make a record? You know, and we were like, yeah, that's what we're here for. And then we, we like played through our, our songs and he was like, okay, let's cut. And he had us like play through each, each song, like, like very intentionally. And he was like, why is there a minute and a half long intro to the song? Right. With, where where nothing's happening, where it's just sort of like you know moody, ambient stuff, and you know I was like, well, because that's like the part where you get into it, you know, and he's like, no, dude, that's not gonna fly. He's like, we're not record. we're not actually at a live show, so nobody has to go up to the bar and order their beer during the beginning of your song. Exactly, exactly, and then you know, like basically, those were the shows that we were playing at the time. Was just like playing in clubs, playing, you know, just sort of getting into the mood of 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 a show. But what what I took away from from those sessions with him for like making records is that you just, it's all killer, no filler, you know? Right. And it's the same, it's the same as with like, you know, I, I guess I can 
like check this to like writing poetry and writing stories like you know you don't need to hear every single detail about what you know the room looks like you don't need to like know every single inch of you know uh whatever you're looking at as an image in the story just get to it you know get to the image get to the point and with music yeah it's it's like if 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 the song if if a part isn't contributing to the forward momentum of the song in some way if there's no hook if there's no like interesting rhythmic element then it might have to go um and i've I, i've worked with some artists you know over the past year and a half or so and had some you know i wouldn't say difficult conversations but like have had some you know butting heads a little bit like man i don't think this is working i like if you're hiring me to be your producer I would really suggest cutting this section. <laughs> right. This is not, you know what I mean? So like, so that's something that that's I... That's a tough one to do. You know, I, um, yeah. you know, for me, I always try and start with asking if they would like feedback first, you know? Sure, you, sure. A lot of times you get the answer like, yeah, you know, of course. But, yeah, of course. But, you know, do, but then, trying to yeah. ask permission for whether or not they would like that kind of input. And, you know, do you guys want some, you know, critical listening input? Um so one of the artists that you've worked with, Jordan Carr, is in your playlist, um, yeah. The Never-Ending Hangover. Great, great <laughs> title. Um, and it's got some great, huge foot stomps in there and stuff like that. Do you have any stories to share about making that record? Yeah, that was that was back before I knew what I was doing. That was like 2012, I think. Oh, and that's, that's why it sounds so good. <laughs> yeah, right. So that record, um, with those foot stomps and stuff, God, Jordan, he's he he's gonna love this when he hears it. Um he uh yeah, he just approached me one day. He said, I I've heard some of the stuff you've been doing, you know, this is years ago. And he said, I, I want to work with you. And I said, Okay. So we met every day that summer um and just like made recordings, hit record, you know, and just tracked. And I'm so embarrassed, but all I had at the time was Oh, it's it's really embarrassing. Um, I had a Behringer live, like eight channel live mixer, right? Awesome. Plugged in through the RCA into my the line input on a previous MacBook, then not the one I was talking about earlier, but like a really old MacBook into GarageBand, just like layering tracks. Oh God. <laughs> That's so funny. You know, like to kind of like look at what I'm my gear now. I'm like, I, I can't believe I did it then. But um yeah, that was really fun because, you know, we were friends and he was full of energy and full of like ideas. And I was just really there to just hit record and kind of like offer some advice on stuff. Um, and that was a really kind of fun project that uh, I think that might have been the first like actual record, you know, that I made for somebody. Um, and yeah, there's just all, all kinds of that. Whenever I listen to it, which is, you know, pretty rare because I'm all, all I can hear are, are its flaws. Um, but when I do listen to it, it really brings me back to that summer, which was a kind of like a formative time for all of us sort of in, in town here. There was kind of a lot going on uh, at that time. And what, it's just one of those. Yeah. What? So, you, so your, your studio has come a long way. Um, do you sort of have an approach to mixing now? Do you sort of have a mix template that you like to start with or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I do, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I I record primarily in Logic. Um, I'm like trying and trying and trying to like break back into Pro Tools. I, I use Pro Tools. You know, I had a rig. I was borrowing a M box and an iLock from a friend years ago, and then they moved away. And so I've been in Logic since then. And right on. Um, yeah, I I ain't more nothing wrong with Logic. Logic is cool. Yeah. It's what I like about it is, is you can, I can open up the like MIDI stuff and I can just get right into that. And so it's the workflow is quick for me, but yeah. it's only because I know it as well as I do. But as far as mixing goes, yeah, I, um, I try, I, I try more and more and more these days to get the good tone in the room, right? We kind of talked about drum, drum overheads and things like that earlier. Like, like I was doing a session on drums the other day and the snare had this like really weird like woo kind of right, sound every right. every time the drummer hit it and I would, we spent probably 10 minutes trying to figure out where the hell that was coming from and eventually like muted it to the point where it kind of got buried in the mix which I was okay with yeah um so you know 2 years ago even last year with the christmas record I probably had like eight plugins you know maybe 10 plugins per channel like EQs compressors all kinds of crap like that um which is fine and it's maybe that's how you do it but i've i've really been focusing lately on simplicity and i think a lot of that comes from listening to to your podcast really 
and hearing hearing the the guests get kind of talk about like capturing the sound in the room, capturing the performance in the room yeah. with with the right mic, with the right amp or or whatever, uh, so that the work is like eighty percent of the way co- completed by the time you get to the mix. And all you maybe have to do is like like level and compress and like cut some low end or something. Right, right. Otherwise, it's really more like post production if you're recreating oh God. things. Yeah. So. Dude, I, I think back on on those records that I did prior to this year, all the recording of things, and it's just like a mess. <laughs> There's just yeah. like so much EQ crap everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. funny. Sometimes I go back and listen to old mixes, and I did crazy moves on them. And then sometimes I hear them, I'm like, wow, it's really cool. How did I do that? You know? Yeah, yeah. I like going back and listening to old stuff. And where I, just like you said, I feel like I didn't have any of the good tools I have now. But yet it sounds really cool. I'm like, well, shit. Yeah. Yep. I started out with a with a Tascam four track, um, the four twenty four, I think. And I I made like, I don't know, at least an album's worth of solo material with that thing. And I I had like three fifty sevens and a fifty eight. I didn't know what a condenser was. You know, I was just recording right to tape, bouncing it down to the fourth track, you know, and just layering. And I listened back to those records, well, those recordings anyway, that I made, you know, I was 18, 19, and like they sound freaking cool. Yeah. Um, and then I I think about stuff I'm trying to do now, and I'm like, not everything I'm trying to do now, but sometimes you can just like labor over <laughs> labor over a mic placement or something. And so like while part of me is really happy to be at the point where I'm aware of like that wonging kind of snare drum and how that's going to bother me later. Uh, another part of me is like, man, just that up. Another part of me misses that sort of like spontaneous throw up the mics, hit record and just get the, get the vibe. Right. You know? In other so, words, when you started, you wouldn't have worried about it. You would just move forward. Wouldn't have even heard it. You yeah. know, you wouldn't have even noticed yeah. just like, uh, drums sound cool. Hit record. And I then, remember like, actually, I yeah. remember that like right when I went to school, I was at MTSU and my buddy was recording us up at Webster College. He he was doing the recording program there. So we became his senior project or whatever. Yeah. So we went in and and we're on the beginning of the session. And same thing, like I spent two hours or something like trying to get the ring out of the snare before we got going. And it was so funny because like later I went and listened back and I was like, what was I even doing? You know, it's like, yeah. Like I didn't, I completely didn't recognize what the style of the drums were or the drummer or how a ringing snare was actually just the right thing for that particular song possibly. But right, it's right. just, you know, you kind of have to go through that process. You learn these things, you try them out, then you realize like, oh, wait, I don't actually need to apply this in this instance. Yeah. And and that's what's been really cool. Like I, I mentioned the like 10,000 hours thing earlier, and I don't know if I finished going on about that, but that article that I read uh, about the 10,000 hours, sort of like the the myth of that, you know, it was saying like, we're obsessed with getting perfect at the one thing. And that kind of can take away maybe from from other other things that we can also become really good at. So uh, I guess maybe... So we want to be a, yeah. a one hour expert of 10,000 things. <laughs> <laughs> I did the math on, on it this morning. And I was like, if you work eight hours, a, like if you work, you would have to work for about like, three and a half years. Yeah, yeah. Straight, I always remember yeah. five years is what was my takeaway that like, sure, if you do something regularly for about five years, which, you know, three and a half, if you're constant, nonstop, yeah. but um, that, that you pretty much hit that 10,000. So yeah. that's kind of interesting because then you realize you're like, oh, I am kind of an expert, a master of some things. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's really cool to to look back one year ago today um, when I like was first getting like shipments from FedEx with with like all these preamps and microphones and stuff and going like, ooh, I wonder what this is going to sound like. Yeah. And now uh, now I'm like looking at my like rack that my buddy made for me and just like like everything. I know how it all works, but there's still a still a bit of a mystery to it, you know, and that's really exciting. Um, but yeah, like like you don't know you don't know how something sounds or what something is going to do or what something is going to, you know, be or whatever until you work with it and until you allow yourself to make those mistakes maybe and learn from them. And that's kind of one of my biggest takeaways from really diving in at the beginning of last year as a, as a recording engineer um, is I made a lot of mistakes and I've, I'm learning from them and I'm only going to get better the more I work. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, that's absolutely a hundred percent true. It's like, you learn all these things, you know, here on the podcast, we're, we're talking about all these different techniques, different 
you know, signal chains, different plugins to use. And sometimes I think people push back kind of like, you can't talk about that because it's different for everybody. But my point is like, who cares? You know, it's like, I just want, I want 10,000 different ideas to try so that I go try them all. And then, and then I just, once I try them, I have a, a gut sense of what, you know, how it worked or didn't work. And now it's, yeah. now it's a color in the palette that I can go use and try on something. Um, and I, I just always want something, you know, it's like, I just want something to do in the studio. I want like, I want somebody to hand me a piece of poetry and say, write a song, or I want to <laughs> already have a song and be like, Oh, I got this new mic pre I'm going to use that on everything. And now I've got this thing, you know, you just want, I just want a reason to always r- record the next idea. Something yeah. to just kind of keep it moving forward. Yeah, 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 totally. And and um, that's why I I love this room that I'm in right now. Like I, I mentioned earlier, I've got you know all these keyboards and instruments kind of just out and ready to go. My 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 preamp rack is is it's on wheels. I can roll it around the studio. Nice. My my headphone mixers are are on like really long cables, so I can put somebody anywhere I want to go. You can just throw um, it. You just toss it to somebody across yeah. the room. Yeah, like catch, man. It's a football, you know. Yeah. Well, and, one of the uh, so I, I should yeah. shout out one of the cool things about something like the Hearback system. I, I have the I got the PreSonus ear mix system in my studio. Um, you know, there's there's a few different ones, but they can be self powered over an Ethernet cable. So it's like this headphone mixer that just has one long, you know, easy to move around the room cable going to it, and that makes it really convenient, which is cool. Yeah, it's totally cool. Yeah. The OWC Envoy Pro Electron is the fastest, toughest, mini-sized, universal, portable USB-C SSD that lets you record from anywhere in the galaxy with confidence. With speeds of up to more than a gigabyte per second real-world performance, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron gives you high-speed audio data for recording and playback. Take your sessions and sample libraries with you anywhere you go. Built for reliability, the OWC OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Never worry about your storage and the safety of your music again. Find the new OWC Envoy Pro Electron and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Um, what are some of the other favorite lessons you learned from recording studio rockstars? Any things in specific you want to um, chat about or stuff you remember about either you know, recording drums, guitars, mixing vocals. I don't know if, you know, if I'm putting you on the spot, then just uh, yeah, segue no, to something cool. else. But yeah, maybe no, you no, remember right. some stuff. I do. And I mean, all kinds of stuff um, that, I, that I've tried out and probably have forgotten about, you know. Um, but one of the biggest things that that really has stuck with me is um, something we kind of touched on earlier. It's, it's that, you know, engineer, producer, client, artist relationship, right? Like I have... I have my ideas, you know, about like how I think the song should go, like the sort of overall pace of it and the arrangement and things like that. And, you know, for the most part, the artist comes in and they've they've been cool and they've like known what they want to do. But, you know, there have been times where it's like, man, I think those hi-hats are a little too brashy for what I'm after here. Or that's because that, they are. <laughs> that's because they are right. I mean, like, you know, so like, so like... Or like, boy, that ride symbol, you're really hitting it hard, you know? Um, and something that I've learned and, and I'm very grateful for, you know, from the podcast is, you know, a lot of the engineers, uh, the guests, you know, who are doing this work every day, you know, can just have, have basically said like, you know, you do what you can to get the artist to kind of do what you want, do what should sound best. But at the end of the day, it's like their record. Yeah. Um, it's, it's their recording. And um and there, there's one moment, I don't remember who the guest was, but he was talking about like, yeah, I just went out into the studio and I just took the cymbal that the drummer was smashing off the cymbal stand <laughs> in like middle of the song and just like, you're not using this anymore. I I don't think I can do that <laughs> with uh, the folks I'm working with because we're all mostly friends around here. Um, my studio is ground level, but I kind of wish that I had a window in the room yeah. that was like 10 stories up. And and I wish that in the middle of a session I could just go out there and grab the hi hats or the symbols and then just open this mythical window and just toss them right out the window, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I mean, That'd be a honestly, nice effect. Yeah, yeah. Like, dude, like, trust me. Okay, You're, this is not going to sound good. Um, but yeah, I think that that one of my biggest things is is how to interact, like 
respectfully, yeah, with with your with the artist. And again, like I said, like most of the people that I'm working with are friends. I have a, a long, you know, decade long relationship with most of these people here. But you know, it's one thing to be friends, sharing stages, you know, hanging out after the show. And it's totally another thing to be like in sort of charge of them capturing their art, right? Their music. Um, and there's a vulnerability and a sort of like apprehension, I think, on the on an artist's behalf um, that can come out of, of working together on uh, in, in the studio. And so... I love like, it. Well, I got a quote for you. So sure. the recording studio where friendships go to die. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> depending on depending on your temperament, man. <laughs> I I uh I've I've certainly had to check myself a few times. Um not that I'm a hothead by any stretch, but you know, um yeah, that th- that's one of the biggest things, yeah, to just to kind of kind of cap it, I think. Um short of like geeking out about like gear and compressors and all this kind of stuff, like really really no really learning and being attentive to like the artist producer relationship um, is something that, that I'm still working on, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm working with a cat right now and his songs are really cool. And so he's like, he asks for my advice sometimes and I'm like, well, maybe try this. And if he takes it, he takes it. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. And I just have to kind of, you know, keep pressing record and making it happen. Well, so one of the things for us to remember is that, you know, we just talked about this 10,000 hour idea as if we, we learn to understand that we need to, try the things that work and try the things that don't work so we can internalize them. And I think the interesting thing for me to remember is so does the artist who's on the mic. Like they can't internalize any of this stuff unless they also got a chance to try it. And that's where it's a learning lesson for me is like, if we, if we try too hard to, um, you know, steer them clear of every pitfall, it's like we might not be doing people a favor because they mean they may need to, try it and experience it and then come even just maybe it's as quick as coming into the control room and hearing that it doesn't work. And then you can sort of like gently talk about it together and point out things that won't work or don't work. Or maybe you don't even need to say a thing. Maybe they just come in and hear it and they instantly know, Oh, that, that doesn't work. I'm going to go do something different. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. I've, I've, I've exactly experienced that. Yeah. Like let's try this harmony and then you play it back and, or let, let's try this, whatever. And you play it back and they're like, Oh no, no, that's not it. But yeah. you know, I, I fully agree. And, and then you said it earlier too, like, I want to try 10,000 ideas and I want to see, you know, because if you don't try them, you don't know. Um, there's this like, like sort of story about the the pottery professor right who who gives half the class you have to perfect this one pot right right and the other right. class make as many pots as possible and obviously if you the more you do the better you get the more creative you get and that's you know what's what's awesome about recording is that you're in logic you're in pro tools there's no limit you just put it put anything down you know go out and find some ants chewing on wood and record that and move <laughs> that in you know it's it's cool <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other particular uh, tips on uh, stuff you learned from the the podcast that you remember? What about what about some miking techniques? Were there any things that you, or just you know whether it came from that and you remember it or not? But just like recent stuff where you tried recording the drums different, the guitars different. Um, you talked about having the ready, uh, uh, the red ready, the yeah. red di <laughs> for yeah, bass yeah. stuff like that. Any any fun new methods you've arrived at? Um, I had my friend Zach come down. I keep talking about Zach. He's 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 a he's a cat that like he he spent like two years interning in the studio where we recorded after we recorded there. And I a lot of stuff that I know I've learned from him. Um he's just sort of really like helpful with sharing information about recording. Cool. Um yeah, and and he, you know, he came down and, and he helped me and engineer the uh first drum session for my solo record that I'm working on. And um we took my <clears throat> we we took my uh, cascade, you know, fathead ribbons, uh, and I had been just sort of like floating them above the the floor tom and the snare, kind of like in the the huge, you know, standard like overhead kind of position. Mm-hmm. And he stuck them he stuck them on one boom stand on you know one overhead stand on an X Y kind of. And I was like, what's this? And he goes, well, you know, the the middle part of the of the ribbon that's the null zone. And I was like, the what? You know, like I'm such right. an idiot, right? <laughs> and like like oh, so. Um, figuring out about how that how the, how those mics work uh, was was really revelatory, and how to like angle them so they're blocking the symbols and sort of positioning them in these certain ways. Um, 
And I know, you know, I've listened to this podcast for over a year and I'm, I'm like totally, I feel bad. I'm blanking <laughs> on no, like a, right, lot of the, right. a lot of the lessons, but, um, what really, about the angling yeah. to block the symbols? Maybe break that down a little bit more. What does that sure, mean? Sure. So, you know, so you got your, get your 16 inch high crash above the snare. If you're a right-handed drummer, right. Or wherever the hell it is. And then you've got your ride symbol on the other side and the drummer is just trying to beat the hell out of both of them at the same time. Um, and like, that's the sound that you don't want in your overheads. I mean, if, if you're me mixing, this is like my, my, my preference. Right. In More other words, you, you're trying to capture the overheads where they, where you get the full kit in them. Yeah. Yeah. More of that kit, you know? And, and so like when you put the symbols in the like null zone, you're, you know, effectively like blocking them or at least like muting them, right. From, from getting in, into the snare mix, right. We're going to keep the, pushing you to break that down. So what, what do you mean by the null zone? <laughs> sure. So if you hold the cascade in your hand, it's it's this. It's got a the 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 like you know the part where you plug the mic in and the handle, and then the big like fat head sort of circular ribbon you know uh, basket or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And around the edges of that, there is a band, right? It's just a little gold band. Um, and if you are in front of the mic or behind the mic, the mic is picking up the sound. But if you're beside the microphone, it's really not picking up anything. Uh, which is cool. I've I put these on on horns, on a on trumpet and a saxophone, and like there's absolutely nothing if they're positioned correctly, you know, coming in on the side. So you can really, really isolate instruments really well with those mics, um, even though so, they're right next to each other in the studio. Yeah, it's right? yeah. it's it's like very, very like like wow, it works. Uh, so when you position these over, you know, on drum overheads, uh, you kind of angle one mic so that the ride symbol is in the null zone and the other mic so that the sort of hi hats and the the crash are in the null zone right so you're really just getting this sort of like focused picture of of the overhead side of the of the snare side of the kit and the, of the floor tom side of the kit you know that you can then and of course the symbols are getting in because they're freaking symbols and they're going right. to get into everything <laughs> you know what i mean you listen to the kick drum and you've got the hi hats crashing away down there or whatever um, but you know you're sort of working to get a like overall picture of the of the drum kit from the overheads and i think that that's something that now that i think about it that i learned from the podcast like the overheads you want to use to kind of get the like the like photograph of, right. of the drum kit right? right right and like you don't want that photograph to be totally blown out by you know overexposure which i guess in this metaphor could be the symbols right you want it to be like just sort of beautiful and maybe even muted in a way um, so that you can use other microphones, right, to kind of bring in more of that sort of color and things like that. All right. So here's a question that came in from one of our listeners, Cole Smith. Shout out to you, Cole, for asking this. Um, it's a general one, and I'm curious what you think, but um, what techniques or gear did not produce satisfactory results for you? Or let's talk about some big failures. So basically, like, was there anything that you remember learning about it, and then you went to try it and you're like, this, this sounds like shit. I don't like this at all. Um, Especially if it's something I taught you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think a lot of my, my failures, uh, you know, and I, I'll, I'll speak openly about them. Like I'm not afraid of, of, of talking about stuff that I've done wrong, I guess. Um, maybe they've come from like gear limitations and just being like at, at the mercy of, of like, uh, my, um, uh, freaking, what do you call it? The I had ha before I got the Apollo. I had a Focusrite uh, interface, and you know, Focusrite's totally cool. Um, it was the Scarlett eighteen i twenty, and I was getting a lot of pops and clicks, you know, in in my recordings that I think were from latency, <laughs> uh, and so that was sort of ruining recordings. And I mean, maybe mm -hmm. there was a way around it with some like buffer settings and kind of stuff like that. But um, I'm not saying you need to go out and spend like three thousand dollars on like top of the line, you know, IO gear, but, um, having, having been fortunate enough to get work to invest in my studio has allowed me to get gear that can work as fast and work for the best results, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, maybe going back to like using a lot of plugins and stuff like that, like for a long time, yeah, I was just like caking every, <laughs> every like channel strip in, in plugins and, and just gushing everything with reverb and and just like I don't know, kind of, kind of like working in isolation almost on on individual tracks. And another thing that I've picked up, I guess, from the podcast is like, you know, sure you can like see other compressors working like 
with db reduction you know in in solo mode but like you really kind of got to hear it in the mix and so right. like learning how to mix the mix right instead of mix like the individual instruments um is something that took me a while to to kind of get to yeah i uh, think that's a good tip i feel like for me it's um you you first learn about solo is like oh you can solo an instrument so you can hear it so you can start doing things and then you think you're hearing what you're doing to it but but eventually you are learning how to mix where you don't have to solo things as much and it's almost like you use a mute instead of a solo now i'm more interested yeah. in like well, what happens if I mute something? What's left over? That maybe helps me understand how it's working in the whole mix. Yeah, I I, I just love the thing. I, you know, again, I don't know who had said it. I, probably everybody on the podcast, and and now I'll say it too. But like, I'm I'm almost at the point now where I feel like I can just do a mix with like a simple EQ, a simple compressor, maybe right, and like the faders. Yeah, and especially like, if you're getting good sounds to begin with. Yeah, yeah, and and that's something that like. I, I did some singles for some local bands in like 2018, 2019. And, you know, like they sound fine, but like I wasn't paying attention to the things that I now know to pay attention to. And again, that just gets into the like, just doing the work constantly, keeping your head down and moving forward and and, and working. And also maybe that's something else that I could say, you know, one of my limit, one thing of holding me back in, in the past was like, like, not asking questions and like not taking advice, I guess, and just sort of mm-hmm. being a little arrogant maybe about like what I thought I knew I was doing. Um, and so when I finally realized like I had no idea what I was doing, right? It was, it's like Socrates old thing. Like I, I know nothing, therefore I am wise or, right. or, or, you know, something or whoever right. said that. Yeah. There was a recent uh, tweet or something that was uh, about Elon Musk and um, Jeff Bezos and, it was something along the lines of these guys both get a um, an adrenaline rush, like a dopamine rush, when they're wrong about proven wrong about something, with the idea that, and I don't know if it's actually true, but <laughs> with the idea that um, it, they get excited about being wrong because it means they're now one step closer to the truth. And I like that as a way of thinking in the studio too. For me to be to learn to be excited about messing up because. Uh, well, hopefully messing up and discovering what the right way to have done it would be. Because it's a bummer yeah. if you mess up and you still have no idea how to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and actually, I, I can speak kind of like directly to that. Um, I, I did a drum session for for the this this music video sort of thing that I'm producing for the Mankato Lung Asso- American Lung Association. Um, long long story kind of there, but I had the drummer in uh, my my like studio drummer guy that I always call up. And, you know, he was tracking to a click. We did a ton of takes. He's a solid drummer. And I got home and I was trying to use, you know, I'm using like Beat Detective and Pro Tools to kind of like, just kind of like nudge everything in place. Mm-hmm. And I, I get to a couple sections where he did like a, like a measure, you know, fill. Uh, and, you know, consistently he would come in ahead of the downbeat on the next, like he would finish, he would basically rush the fill, right? Every and, kick drum on the one that ever follows a fill in my Pro Tools that's probably ever been recorded always <laughs> lands early. Dude, it, and I, I was like, I was like, why the hell can't it, why, why can't it, why can't I get this? And then I was like, oh, because the the performance is just ahead. And so I took that as a sort of like, like, even though I did a ton of takes, he was consistently ahead on on the fill. And so next time I do a drum session, you know, I I might pay more attention to the drum fill sections and say, hey, let's punch these fills. Let's calm down a bit. Let's just, you know, really kind of lock in with the, with the tempo here um, so that you're not trying to nudge stuff around if, if you're even into nudging your drums around um, later. So, so yeah, like that was a mistake that I as an engineer, I guess, you know, made like not paying full attention to the performance that I will be paying attention to in the future. And that can kind of go for any any performance, any instrument in the studio, right? Like I've had, you know, your, your vocalist could be rushing, they could be flat, they could be sharp. And if you're not, you know, you got to be sort of listening to that and like making sure that you can have the performer like get as close to being tight, I guess, as you can get them to be. Well, so a little pushback on that. I, I can't remember if sure. it's John Fields who said this on the podcast. He's um, from up that way too. Uh, I think his uncle was there in Minneapolis cool. um, and he where he got to start. And, uh, and I believe I heard Eric Valentine talk about this too, which is that reminder that there's a reason why Phil's speed up and the one is, is ahead. 
And sometimes that's because that's the way it's supposed to be, you know? Yeah. We get stuck on, um, you know, grids being a representation of what a steady tempo of a song is, but it's not always true. Sometimes it's like the fill to sound exciting needs to speed up a little bit and it can make sense to actually restart the grid at this new downbeat that's slightly rushed. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say, yeah. And I, I, you know, fully agree with that. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, that, that there has to be some element of humanity, you know, in, in your, in your recordings. Like if you're working with a drum machine, sure. That's totally cool. Drum machine's always going to be on, but if you're, if you're that live performer, man, like it's fine to make a little bit of a, to not be totally perfect because like, that's kind of boring. Howdy, rock stars. Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here are just some of the things that students are saying about the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass. This one comes from David P. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. And Shane J says, I've literally watched it two times at length, taken a plethora of notes, then combed back over some sections even more. You really knocked it out of the park on this one, and it was so incredibly eye-opening and useful immediately. Look, it's a lot of fun to mix. I'm like you, but it can be really frustrating to keep doing the same things over and over again, but not getting the results that you really want. So when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go check out ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and get started now using the free preview button where you can immediately watch Craig's ultimate snare mixing trick. Happy mixing, rock stars. Cool. So let's jump to some of these outro questions too. Um, Kind of at the last one, to be honest. Um, so, you know, we've talked about this a little bit already, but but see if there's anything more you want to add to just advice for the rock stars on, you know, either a tip for doing the business side of recording and music or just a resource for them. Um, anything in case they want to do this for more than just a hobby? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And um, I think I can kind of track back to my my time at well I shouldn't say my time but like like go back to being you know the like doing everything for my band right like I, I was writing press releases I was booking shows I was you know seeking uh, basically seeking attention for the band um you know and just really kind of through that learned how to you know like use social media in a lot of ways to like to you know promote the group to get attention for the group um, and so kind of when it came to um, really kind of when it came to like getting the, the Christmas album out there, which uh, again is my, I consider that my like first sort of big, big album. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sure, I was doing it for the, for the local newspaper, but I was also kind of doing it for myself. And I, I was imagining that record as, as, as a sort of like resume, you know, for getting more jobs, um, which, which really... It, it it has become. Um, and so, you know, the, the business side, I think there's like a, there's maybe sort of like a, we can fall into this like false modesty sort of feeling where we are a little afraid to put ourselves out there um, and then to sort of do self-promotion. But like, that's the name of the game um, right now. And I think, you know, learn, <laughs> learning how to use Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and I hate to say right, it, but like, right. but like Instagram and Facebook, um, those those social media outlets. I don't really use Twitter, so like you can use Twitter if you want. That's cool too. But like, you know, I I try to to post something from my studio page uh, on Instagram once a day, just a little something, whether it's a video I'm editing or oh look at me, I'm in the studio or whatever it is. I just try to like keep myself like on you know out there basically so like um yeah do as you can staying on the radar right exactly just stay keep make yourself a little blip that never goes away yeah and um make yourself a little (laughs) blip that never goes away right you know well i I mean mean, the podcast is that i mean like for me the biggest takeaway of doing this podcast was the power of consistency yeah um so having a weekly show that always and always 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 will be there for you rock stars every week um 
is more of an impact than any other thing that I can do regarding that. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, there, there's certainly uh, oversaturation, but like if, if you can tread that line, and I'm obviously not saying that you're oversaturating. Oh, no, I know how to oversaturate. I do it sometimes, but, yeah, but you know, no, as far as the podcast goes, you know, just like the consistency of schedule, you know, it's like yeah. you doing your Instagram, just like maybe. You know, some people say like just maybe once a day or something like yeah. that. Yeah, once a day, little story here and there. You know, the little like twenty four hour story thing. Um, yeah, I I think you know there's there's like a fine line where people are like interested, where you can make people interested in what you're doing, and then also and then you cross that line and they're just sort of like eh, they're always posting stuff. Like I, I I don't care anymore. You 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 you've worn yourself out. You're you know you're that single that was in rotation throughout every single day on the radio, you know, and you get sick of it. So yeah, like really just trying to figure out what works for for you uh, in kind of self-promoting. Um, and, you know, just to get back to like, I guess why I'm talking to you today, uh, you know, Lidge is, is like not being afraid to to like reach out to people to to kind of take that leap. Um, I think I, I spent a long time being afraid to like take the next step. Whether that was buying a good mic, buying a good computer, buying a good preamp, um, you know, I, I finally like just said, "Fuck it!" <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. there are things that I want to do with my life, and they're not going to happen unless I do them. And you know, I've I've done a lot already in in my life that's that's allowed me to get to this point where where I can where I have these tools and 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 have this sort of like these abilities, right? Um, to to make some of these things happen, like. Um, you know, all of my writing training has has helped me become a, a good writer and be able to like you know write emails and press releases and things like that. My my training as a musician has helped me not only play and write songs but also help other musicians you know record their songs. Uh, and you know, all these other little things have um have have helped me get to the point where I feel confident in myself uh, to sort of reach out and and take steps to do things that I want to do. That's groovy. I love it, man. Well, we're glad that you're here and it's been a super blast to hang out with you and meet you, listen to your music, which has been very cool to discover. Great sounding stuff. Well, so um, I'll go I'll go to our closing question. This one is hypothetical. You've probably heard it before, which is um, we're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine and you get to go back in time and find young Colin, um, you know, who's who's like, don't don't interrupt me. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are on right now. <laughs> Maybe a little <laughs> later than that. <laughs> yeah, you say, uh, I've come back to um, dressed up in my turtle outfit with a um, karate bandana on my head. Uh, here's the <laughs> single most important thing you need to know, young Colin, to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself early on if you could? I would tell myself, I think what I just said, um, don't be afraid don't be afraid to to ask questions. Don't be afraid to take that leap. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe I'm just like being redundant here, but I I I think my when I didn't know things kind of came easy to me, you know, in a, a lot of ways. And then when I would get to a point where I didn't know something like, like what's this knob on my four track for? I have no idea. You know, I just wouldn't touch it. What's right. this knob on this mixer for? I don't know what the hell that does. Right. And I just, it just like ceased to exist for me, but like you should know as much as you can know about, you know, specifically speaking about the recording studio, you know, you should know how, how the SSL E channel works, how, how wide the cue is on, on, on the frequency and on that stuff. You should know this stuff. And, um, something that I found myself well really been kind of making myself do lately is getting these answers, whether it's um, reading manuals, which is boring, but also like kind of fun um, or like, you know, asking questions of all the recording guys in, in my life. Like, how does this work? How does that work? Can you reference my mix? Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, just not being afraid to, 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 to find and, and gain the knowledge that you need to do the things you want to do. 
Yeah, it's great. And and I'm, this might sound gross, but rock stars, I recommend you take all your manuals and put them in the bathroom <laughs> of the studio. <laughs> Honestly, man, I the other day I was like, I'm going to read the manuals for, I just got these great plugins from uh, Baby Audio and they're so cool. And I was like, how do, what, what is happening with these, with these plugins? And I'm like reading the manuals and like figuring out how the super VHS works and the spaced out works and just like, like, oh, wow, these are so cool. That's and great. like everything just, you know, everything just makes more sense when you read the manuals. Yeah. 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 All right, dude. Well, thank you for hanging with us on the podcast. It's been a super awesome blast. Let the rock stars know where can they go find out more about you? Where would you, let you like them to go check out your work? Um, if they want to go pick up your album, any of that stuff. Sure. Uh, well, you can follow me on Instagram if you want at uh, Colin Scharf. It's just my name. Uh, my studio page is uh, at goldmine.studios. Um, I'm also on Facebook and, as both of those things. Um, my band is Goodnight Gold Dust. We're on Bandcamp, iTunes, you know, Spotify, all that stuff. Um, uh, yeah, uh, just look up Colin Scharf or Goodnight Gold Dust. You, <laughs> if you find Goodnight Gold Dust, you'll find me. And then from there, you'll you'll find everything you need to know. That's awesome, dude. Well, again, man, great to meet you. And I, I look forward to connecting in person. Um, we got to come check out your studio and make some music someday. Hey, that'd be rad. That'd be really rad, Lidge. Thanks, for, thanks so much for having me, man. This is Yeah, I, it's I, a pleasure, man. Thank yeah. you for reaching out, man. Just awesome to hear your success story. Yeah, thank you. It was, it's really cool just to like, you were in my ears <laughs> all year and now I'm talking to you. It's it's it's, it's wild. Now you're so. in my ears. Yeah, it's cool, man. It's really cool. What, what a thing. <laughs> awesome, dude. Cheers. Yeah, yeah cheers. Thank you. Take Talk care. soon. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who have helped make this episode possible. OWC, Adam Audio, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any plug-in purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription to get access to lots of plugins and rockstars at Jay-Z mike.com for 50% off select vintage series mics for a limited time. And remember to visit the Adam Audio YouTube channel for free interviews and masterclasses and use the coupon code ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in the description of this podcast. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.